Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the East Bay Regional Park District Board Operations Committee. It is October 15th, 2020. And uh, we are starting pretty much on time. And um, we are meeting uh, pursuant to Governor Newsom's executive order number NN2920 and uh, the Alameda County Health Officers current shelter in place. And our, uh, as of that order, our headquarters at uh, 2950 Peralta Oaks is still closed to the public. Um, and so members can, of the public can listen in, to the, in the following ways. Ruby, would you be interested in uh, telling the public how <laughs> they can contact or participate in, the, in this meeting, please? Yes, definitely. There are a variety of ways you can listen in and contact us. If you have any questions during the duration of this meeting, you can send those questions. Uh, please include the agenda item number to board ops committee at ebparks.org. That is our email. You can also leave an email directly at area code 510-544-2500. And in addition to that, you can follow along on our YouTube link. Great, thank you. And with that, would you please conduct a roll call? Yes, um, I will now call roll. Direct, or Chair Rosario? Here. Director Waspy? Here. Director Wieskamp? Here. Um, AGM O'Connor? Here. All right, and also present are various staff from the Operations Department. Great, thank you for so much. And now we will begin with uh, item number two, Review Boy Scouts Special Use Agreement, Los Trompas Regional Park. All right, and we should have our admin analyst, Renee Patterson. There she is, just joining us to give us an update on this item. Okay, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. If you would let me know uh, if you can see it. Sure. Yes. Good. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So today we're here to um, go over the Boy Scouts of America Special Use Agreement. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, good afternoon, <laughs> Committee Chair. Uh, Rosario and director, Directors Wieskamp and Waspy. Uh, my name is Renee Patterson. I'm an Administrative Analyst in Operations, and we're going to go over the Boy Scouts of America Special Use agree Agreement in Las Trompas Regional Wilderness. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Also here today is Tiffany Margolisi, the Business Services Manager in Operations, as well as the Interpretive Parklands Unit Manager, Terry Noonan, and the Park Supervisor for Las Trampas Wilderness Regional Preserve, Matt Moore, and from the Boy Scouts, Rob Hills, who's the Scoutmaster, and Stacy Fultz, who's the Troop Committee Lead. So, uh, an overview of what we're gonna go over is the definition of the special use agreements for the park district, the location, a brief history, highlights of the agreement, and then the staff recommendation. So special use for the park district um, must meet the district's objectives with appropriate public benefit and priority. Special use agreements is defined as any ongoing recreational development, activity, service, or land use that is provided for group and general public benefit by clubs, associations, or similar groups operating as nonprofit entities with membership open to the public. The district currently has 23 special use agreements. And the types of group range from archery, swimming, equestrian, scouting, horticultural, and the like. So the location of the use is on Holly Court, and it's in the southern part of Las Trampas, as you can see in the vicinity map. It's off of Bollinger Canyon Road, 
And the, uh, you can't really see in these uh, yellow lined areas, but there's two buildings inside of each and also the lawn area in front of the buildings as well as in the back of building A. This is a satellite picture just so that you can see a little better where the two buildings are on Holly Court. Holly Court also has a park district residence at the end of the court in, these tr in this tree area right here. And that's the courtyard for Las Trumpas. So the Boy Scouts of America was founded in 1910 and it was uh, intended to prepare young people to make ethical and moral choices over their lifetimes by instilling in them the laws of the Scout Oath and Scout Law. The troop that's there is Troop 834 San Ramon. <coughs> it currently serves about 50 children, ages nine to, or 11 to 18. It has in the past served up to 100 children. Sorry, I'm moving things around on here. Um, so brief history. Uh, the Holly Court property is a former Nike site that was leased from the state of California in 1996 and then purchased in July 1999. The Boy Scouts had a lease with the state for use of the buildings on the court and the park district entered into a five-year special interest recreation agreement with the Boy Scouts in 1996 and has been on a month-to-month -month extension since then. The site originally had eight wood framed bungalow type residential barracks buildings located on either side of the court. And as you could see from the satellite view in the previous slide, all but three of the buildings on the site have been demolished. So the Boy Scouts have use of two buildings for weekly troop meetings, and they have occasional use for dates for staging two trips or troop trips. So the agreement highlights are, we're offering a three-year term with two three-year extensions. The troop uh, currently spends about $2,000 per year on maintenance, and that's cleaning of the buildings, mowing around the buildings, a weed abatement on Holly Court, and tra trash collection on Holly Court. And there's currently no cost to the park district for this use. Uh, building A once has once a week in the evening troop meetings. They hold quarterly courts of honor to recognize the achievements of scouts. They camp out in the back of the buildings a few times a year. And they also stage outings there for unloading their vehicles for camping and backpacking trips and stuff. The second building, building B is used for storage and it has limited use for uh, short term small group meetings. This is um, pictures of the two buildings, as well as the interior of building A, where they have their troop meetings. This is the entry to Holly Court, and you can see they also take care of this area. They keep the weeds down and keep it neat and tidy looking. They have been working very well with all the park supervisors at Las Trampas. And they've been very responsive and responsible in their use. So the recommendation is approval of a special use agreement with the Boy Scouts of America for exclusive use of two buildings in Las Trampas Wilderness Regional Preserve to hold weekly troop meetings and other occasional dates for staging troop activities for one three-year term with the possibility of two additional three-year extensions in exchange for the Boy Scouts of America completing maintenance of the buildings and surrounding areas. If you have any questions, there's quite a few folks here who can uh, answer questions for you. And I'll stop my share. Okay, I'll start with Director Wieskamp. Questions? It looks like a straightforward deal. They do a good job. They've been doing it for years. As far as I know, we've had no problems, um, so why not? 
continue to be valuable. Director Waspy. Well, I, I fully support this and, and fully support the Boy Scouts doing out there. I've seen some of the good work they've done. I was a little intrigued by the slide that showed that they, uh, and, and Renee's quote, of they keep the weeds down at the entrance. Um, I, I don't <laughs> see like, I was, the question would be, um, if I may ask, do you use herbicides or do you use those strong Boy Scouts to cut down the weeds? <laughs> and I don't know if anybody can answer that. Yeah, you, uh, Dr. Waspi, you're probably seeing the brown vegetation along the roadway, and I believe that is the county uh, treating that, uh, not the park district or the Boy Scouts. But we do have Matt Moore here, I believe. Maybe Matt can come on and answer that question more specifically. I thought Matt was on here. No? <laughs> Matt has disappeared. I see his there name. I see, let's see. I've got Matt McDonald, but I don't know if I got Matt Moore on. Oh. Tracy, uh, Terry, can you jump on for this one? Uh, good afternoon, Director Waspy, uh, Terry Noonan, Unit Manager for Interpreter Parklands. Um, it's actually yes to both. Uh, the scouts, uh, either and or the adults, uh, use mechanical removal of the weeds. The right of way along uh, Bollinger Canyon Road is within the county's jurisdiction and they, they treat the road edge. Okay, well, I mean, I, I think it's a real teachable moment. And then, you know, as we refer to the history of the Boy Scouts, they, I don't know what word, word they mentioned, moral and ethical training. And, and I think this is a great teachable moment to show them that we are in fact not using herbicides anymore for all the reasons that we've stated in all of our documents and, and stuff. So I think that same rule should apply and be, be applied to this lease agreement or whatever the, not a lease agreement, but the, the agreement we have with them. And I think it's a great learning experience. And let's face it, if you got 50 strong kids, they can hoe all the weeds in the world. Um, so I would- oh, Absolutely. Um, and t at least for my tenure um, at Las Trampas, the, the area has never been treated with herbicides in and around Holly Court. It's, it's all either been mowed or, or treated mechanically um, with the energetic youth. Excellent. Great. And then my only question is, uh, uh, utilities? Is the, and, uh, do the Boy Scouts pay for utilities or is that the district? Renee, that's, um, do you have an answer for that one? I... Yeah, I don't have an answer for that one. Sorry. Uh, I, I can take it later. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get, also, Director Rosario, we'll get back to you on that one. Yeah, and then also, uh, do we inspect that those buildings that they used? Because I, I think the old, the other buildings that we we uh, took down had asbestos in them. Just so wanted to make sure that the building is inspected and, and uh, is safe for their use. Um, yes, I believe the agreement is going to call for an annual walkthrough inspection um, of the two buildings. We have asked that one be used for just storage of their camping gear and materials. The other building, uh, which is a nicer building, um, be their primary meeting site. They also, you know, have a lot of their meetings outside when uh, the weather accommodates that. And, and uh, traditionally, Director Rosario's, you know, the, the challenge with these old buildings is often the flooring. And as long as it's not torn up and moved, uh, that asbestos hazard is mitigated. So, and we've also, um, it looks like that building has been painted, I'm sure, several times to, in case there's any issues with lead paint. Okay, great. Just, uh, yeah, as long as the, uh, the inspections are looking for that kind of stuff, that, that's, that'd be great. So, um, if there, unless there's any other further questions, uh, I would entertain a motion. No oh, approval. Second. Dir Director Wieskamp, motions for approval and seconded by Director Waspy. And Ruby, would you mind taking a roll call vote, please? Yes, I can. Uh, Chair Rosario? Yes. Director Wieskamp? Yes. Director Waspy? Aye. All right, so moved. Unanimous, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, Renee, just you can give me that answer uh, 
uh, offline about uh, who pays for utilities. <laughs> Thank you. We'll get back to you. Uh, Tiffany has her hand up. Yes. Hi, thank you, uh, Business Services Manager Tiffany Margolisi. So uh, we do have two guests here from uh, the Boy Scouts who may wish just to say a brief hello if uh, they would like to, and including Rob Hills, uh, who did respond that the Boy Scouts uh, do pay for the utilities. Um, ah, okay. So I'll, I'll leave it open to either uh, to Chair Rosario, if you uh, would like to uh, open the floor to the uh, guests at this time. Sure, I would love to hear from them. if they so choose. <laughs> there he is. Hi, uh, thank you so much for uh, letting us use this facility. Uh, we've had over 130 Eagle Scouts since 1980 when we started out there. So this, we are uh, very, very grateful. Um, we do take care of the property without herbicides at all. Um, most anything to do with a mechanical mower are done with the adults because uh, using those machines is not within the rules for scouting. But the boys do a lot of the pickup. Uh, if, I assume you've heard of Leave No Trace, those sorts of things. And so we practice those wherever we go, including out of the shack. So if there are any questions, I'll answer them. But otherwise, we just wanted to express our gratitude. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Would Stacy like to say a couple words? <laughs> I, I think uh, Mr. Hills covered it. Uh, he is correct. We don't use herbicides, and um, the flooring has not been disturbed at all. In fact, I believe it was sealed, um, so that if there was any cracking or anything, it's not happening. Thank Great. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for coming, and um, we're happy to uh, continue our our relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all take care. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, we are now item number three, update from the Interpretive and Recreation Services, Southeast Region. And we have Just a to take quick, uh, I'll do a quick introduction is that uh, um, Ira is gonna talk a little bit more uh, about our digital efforts uh, and the pivot we've done during the pandemic. Um, and we're expanding those efforts. And so I'm pretty excited to hear about this. I think it's, uh, it's gonna be very interesting for the committee members. Ira, I'm passing it off to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, AGM O'Connor. Uh, uh, Chair Rosario and directors, thank you for having me back. I'm Ira Bletz, Regional Interpretive and Recreation Services Manager. I am right now the only Regional Interpretive and Recreation <laughs> Services Manager. Uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about uh, our virtual field trip, our virtual live field trips for schools and the education bundles that our staff has been working on. So this is, this is additional information from the July presentation where we talked about our overall effort uh, in digital learning. So let me share my screen with you. Right, I'm assuming you can all see that. Yes. Excellent. So let me start with just a quick review of the- Ira, oh, can I just yes. interrupt really quick? You're on your notes slide. Can you just do the switch? Oh. Uh, how's that? Thing. Yeah, perfect, yeah. thank you. Okay. Perfect. Uh, let me quickly uh, review the categories of digital learning that we are focusing on with our staff. Uh, first are the pre-recorded virtual public programs that includes things like the Ardenwood July 4th special event, uh, obviously with the park closed and no special events. They took people through an event and gave them lots of hints and opportunities to enjoy the games and contests that are a feature of that event at home. We have our live virtual programming. This is uh, naturalist Morgan Gunther doing a live walk in Redwood, uh, Redwood Reinhardt Regional Park for the SHINE program, our community partners. We also have our app facilitated <coughs> programming. These are the virtual reality pieces that are part of the Parks to People program run out of Mobile Visitor Center 2. And our virtual live field trips a way to still provide service to schools and community groups and other community partners while we're all living through this pandemic. This is naturalist 
uh, Virginia Delgado at Black Diamond uh, meeting with a group. This is Supervising Naturals Kevin Damstra also at Black Diamond. You can see the creative ways our staff have created green screens and uh, studios to allow them to present these programs. We are very fortunate to receive funding from the Regional Parks Foundation. We Some money that was set aside for programs that could not happen during the pandemic were reallocated to allow us to purchase some of the equipment we need to do these live programs. This is naturalist Ashley Adams working from her backyard uh, at Brioni. She lives in the park residence at Brioni's and meeting with a school. For a lot of our virtual school field trips, this is what it looks like from the naturalist side. This is naturalist Francis Mendoza at Coyote Hills. And this is what the class looks like. You can see Francis up there in the upper left-hand corner and you can see the class that he's working with on that program. This is naturalist Claudio Munoz doing a live a walk at Lake Temescal for a class. Uh, so far this year, we have presented 101 of these programs for classes, served 4,329 students, and we have an additional 250 of these programs scheduled to finish out the fall uh, or, or through the end of this year. Uh, teachers interested in the service can go to the district's webpage and here they can link in under the program tab and they can get into the Samaritan user interface system which allows them to create an account and to schedule themselves for a virtual field trip. All the information they need is right there. What types of field trips there are, what are the subjects. And so it's a quite, quite a seamless system using our new software. Great. Uh, the last piece of our effort, education bundles. And the idea here is to provide teachers with a it more in-depth pre-recorded program. So if they want to augment what they're studying in their classroom, then they have this option. Uh, our objective is to create not only of these education bundles, it's all together in one spot. We worked with the Alameda County Office of Education with their staff and, and some classroom teachers to figure out exactly what, what would be valuable for the teachers to have in these bundles. So besides the pre-recorded digital field trip, and I'll be showing you a, a snippet of one in a few minutes, we also create a teacher guide that has all of the other information they need. We give the teachers pre and post activities. There is a companion video where a naturalist is reading a story related to the subject of that bundle. And then the teachers have the opportunity to schedule a chat with a naturalist. So once the students have gone through the unit and they have questions, they can talk live with one of our naturalists and get their questions answered. And we also provide additional resources. These are things say a link to the National Science Teachers Association or the Lawrence Hall of Science, a place that has uh, information that again, supports the, the subject of that bundle. Uh, for all of our science-based programs, we are aligning these bundles with next generation science standards for our uh, cultural history programs. We are aligning them with California uh, social studies and history content standards. And this is a little bit of what we've done for the pond study bundle. So these are the next generation science standards that are supported by the bundle. The, 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 what it means, the K or the two refers to the grade level. So the first one there is kindergarten, LS is life science, and it's standard number one. Uh, the next one, K, again, kindergarten. The ESS is Earth and Space Science, and it is uh, standard number two. And so we provide these for the teachers so they know exactly what's being covered and how that fits into the curriculum that they're already using in their classrooms. We also provide teachers with uh, guided questions. This is something that the folks from the County Office of Ed said would be very helpful for teachers. And this is the, the idea for these is to give the students some questions 
that will get them thinking about the subject. And in education uh, parlance, activates their prior knowledge. We also provide the teachers with suggested sentence frames. And the, again, the idea is to provide the teachers with this information. They don't have to spend their, their time coming up with these. We've already provided them for the team. And this is what a sentence frame looks like. So cross-cutting concepts are an element of next generation science standards that crosses all of the standard areas. Uh, and students at every level are looking for patterns and structure and function and cause and effect. And so that sentence frame, say for patterns, would be uh, one similarity I observed between blank and blank is. And so the students are using these to, to, first of all, put the information they've learned into use, but they're also using the same language as scientists, which is an important element of next generation science standards. We also, as I said, are providing pre and post activities. This is a post activity that goes with the uh, pond study education bundle. And the teachers would get these in the form of a PDF. They can, they can share them with their students and the students can use them at home or in the classroom. Uh, we also are offering pre-recorded stories that go along with the subject. So this is naturalist Morgan Gunther again. This time she's reading a, a pond study book uh, targeted at kindergartners. Uh, for many of the education bundles, we'll actually have two different companion stories if we're covering multiple grade levels. Uh, so we have one that's story that's appropriate for the various grade levels. And then the chat with a naturalist. This is, if you look at the top row, the second square from the left is naturalist Eric Stevens and uh, Skip the teacher. And then there's naturalist Alex Collins, both from uh, Sonol. And they are having a, a live chat with this class uh, following one of their uh, virtual field trip programs. And now I'd like to share with you a, a part of the video. This is the actual uh, pond study pre recorded video. Hello everyone, welcome to the Tilden Nature Area. I'm Trent, a naturalist with the East Bay Regional Park District. Today I'm going to take you on an underwater adventure to explore life beneath the surface of our pond. We're going to do a pond study. Let's get started. Those are the questions that activate the pond, that prior think knowledge. Think about these questions. Have you been to a pond? What different creatures need ponds to survive? We've arrived at the study pond. Looking at the pond, you can see we built see? in pauses into the video as well. Wonder? What does it remind you of? First, I'll fill the tray up with water. Then I can begin netting in the shallows. I'm stirring up the bottom slightly to flush out animals that may live in the sediment. Now it's time for the larger net. This allows me to reach into the deeper parts of the pond where different animals live.
inside the visitor center, digital cameras and macro lenses allow us to take a close look at even the smallest of organisms, like this phantom midge larva. Right, so that gives you a sense of uh, what, what the pre-recorded portion of the education bundle is. We have worked in those questions that activate the prior knowledge. We've worked in break, uh, pauses so the teacher can actually pause the video and have a class discussion. This, this, initial, this initial bundle, the pond study one, is our template. It was put together by this committee, uh, Supervising Naturalist Kevin Damstra from Black Diamond, naturalist Trent Pierce from the Tilden Nature Area who you just saw, uh, naturalist Melissa Folks from Big Break, and naturalist Ashley Adams from Black Diamond. We were very fortunate. Melissa joined our staff just before the pandemic hit, and Melissa came to us as a classroom teacher. So just before she came to work for us, she was a classroom teacher in the New Haven Unified School District, and she's been immensely helpful in creating those sentence stems and, and aligning this material to next generation science standards. This team also uh, did a training for each of our other visitor center staffs on how to create these bundles and on the elements and how to create the supplemental material for teachers. So that training has been completed. All of our staff are working on it. And this is our first set of education bundles along with the pond study. And these, these should be available by the end of this month and available for teachers. We are, again, working with uh, classroom teachers and getting some help from the Alameda County Office of Education. So we will make sure that each of our education bundles is meeting the needs of the teachers that uh, we know will be using them. And let me stop sharing my screen and see if you have any questions. Here's up in the upper left-hand corner, you can see naturalist Erica Stevens doing another school program. <laughs> All right. And have any questions I can answer? Fabulous. Director Wieskamp. No, it looks like uh, your naturalists are out there having a good time and getting ready to have others come and join them. I think it's a great program, especially now. I th I'm sure teachers, parents, everybody, and even the students are enjoying it. So good job all around. Thank you. Director Waspy. Yeah, I think it's tremendous. You guys are incredibly creative. I love it. Um, I'm, I'm interested, I, read, I noticed there's lots of science-based things. Is there any way, um, and I know that schools are very sensitive to this, but can we, can we monopolize the conversation and, and get it any way into the learning? Uh, I, I, you know, we're getting lots and lots of new people coming to the parks uh, based on it's the only place to go. And people, um, some behaviors, um, <laughs> picking up litter, recycling, things like that are, are um, well, people aren't, don't understand. Do, would that be considered, uh, you know, not going teaching to the standard, or is there an opportunity anywhere where we could do something like that? I know this is posting, but and I, but that's obviously a scientific thing, but it's also got to do with waste reduction. Maybe. Sure, sure, and we're actually already thinking of that. So, uh, the small disclaimer you saw in the pond study saying not to collect without a naturalist, uh, and then those. Those kinds of conservation messages are then reinforced in the stories we select, but also the teacher's materials and in the chat with the naturalist that is kind of the conclusion of the program. So yes, we are, we're thinking about those, those messages and working them in uh, to, these, to these bundles. And I just, I wanted to mention it, you saw part of that bundle and it, it seems quite seamless. Our staff has been doing this since March and has gotten much, much better at it. But for every minute of video that we're releasing, it takes us between 45 minutes and an hour of editing and preparation work and all of the production that goes into that. Uh -huh. So it's, uh, we produce a five minute video and it seems great. You just went out with a camera and got a naturalist talking, but it actually to make them uh, look the way they do, and especially for these education bundles that provide that additional material for the teachers uh, built right into the video. It does, it does take our staff uh, more time, but we're making great progress. We have an amazingly creative staff. Thank you, and I, I understand completely about how you have to edit. I was, I was in fear, uh, Trent, when he was uh, uh, dipping into the pond, I thought he'd pull in up in the lake area, I thought he'd pull out, and, but uh, I guess you do edit well. 
So um, I guess one more question. Have you guys ever heard of the concept of Zoom bombing? Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that. I don't know if it's oh, cool. yeah, wait, yes. Actually, I am, yes. So uh, we work with the schools. So when we, when we, for the live virtual programs, when we're working with the school, they, the schools are actually the ones that send out the Zoom invita invitation. And it has, it has, they're either using waiting rooms or they're using a passcode for our staff to get in there. We're not, we're not sending out the Zoom messages. They're actually inviting our staff uh, at the prearranged program time. Well, okay, I was referring to your, your colleagues over at HARD who, who were really proud of the fact that they, the, the interpretive staff is doing things called Zoom bombing in, in meetings like, well, other, other than this meeting, of course, there are some Zoom meetings that get a little, what's, uh, for lack of a better word, dull, re repetitive, <laughs> and then every once in a while, the natural staff will pop on with a 10 second, make you happy, mm -hmm. you're sitting home in a cave, but we're, we're representing the park and, and here's what it's really all about. I don't know. If you have any we, that actually, that, that's, a, that's something new. I, we'd be happy to try it. We've got, we've got people people who love, uh, <laughs> love that. I'll work with the legislative committee. We'd love to have you Zoom bomb, Mr. Kenzie. <laughs> <laughs> we leave a little stress. Okay. Uh, uh, great programs. Uh, this is, it's it's really uh, wonderful how uh, you your whole department's been able to pivot and uh, pr provide these. Uh, my question, in, in, uh, in the interest of uh, trying to, to see who we reach, are we able to um, uh, figure out the de demographics or track the demographics of which schools and how many kids and the demographics the makeup of that school uh, of each class? Are we able to track that? Uh, yes, I mean we we certainly we certainly know the school. We know the age of the students. We know the number of students. We know if those if those schools are where they stand as far as their eligibility for free and reduced lunches. We have all of that information. We are also one of the nice things about the education bundles is that they will be on on the district webpage. Uh, under the digital learning tab, they will be available. As far as our virtual live programs, we started initially uh, to pilot this and get it running with schools that we had canceled out or had canceled out on us as the pandemic began. Uh, and our next phase is to look at the information we can get out to schools that we are not serving and identify uh, those areas in the district where we would like to provide this service, but they simply don't know that we have it available. And so we'll be doing some direct marketing and also working with the school districts and working with the county offices of education to get that information out and let them know these new services are available. That's excellent. But yes, we do, uh, we do collect all of that information. We also, do, we also do teacher surveys after the virtual live program. So we're getting feedback from the educators to let us know how well it went. Do they have any suggestions for improving the, the live programming? Um, so yes, we're very interested in, in reaching as many groups as we can, as many classes all across the two counties and making, making these programs uh, as professional and as valuable as the in-person programs that someday we'll get back to in the parks. Mm -hmm. But the, these digital efforts will not go away. I'm sure that going forward in the future, even as the pandemic goes away, we will still have digital elements and we'll still be putting staff resources into creating these tools for teachers. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I don't see them going away. I think they'll augment any live uh, presentations that we could offer. Uh, it'll, right. it'll be a perfect plan. So congratulations. Uh, the last question is, uh, is there any thought to uh, doing a, uh, a bundle on uh, Native Americans? Uh, yes. Yes, we, we, our digital learning plan has that initial bundle that is, uh, set that I shared with you. We also have a goal of creating a full second bundle. So that would be eight more bundles uh, by the end of January of next year. Great. And so, yes, we will, parks like Coyote Hills or Ardenwood uh, will be doing programs that are focused on cultural history and uh, native peoples, uh, 
local history. And those, and as I mentioned at the beginning, those will be aligned more with the uh, history and social studies, state content standards, uh, where appropriate next generation science standards, but that's really a, obviously science-based. And we have another set of standards that guide us when we develop programs that focus on uh, cultural history. Fabulous. Hey, Jim O'Connor. Yeah, just, um, I think the concept, uh, what you're saying is really important is that I don't think this is going to end because, you know, one of the things we've always had a limitation, we've had about 60, 62,000 students we serve a year under non-pandemic conditions. And that's always limited, obviously, by the, the timelines and the limitations on staffing that we have, um, in addition to the limitations that schools have. But I think this is really exciting that, you know, it's kind of the silver lining out of this is that you're right, Director Rosario, we're gonna be able to extend this now where we might have a live school group, you know, out in the park, you know, once the pandemic's gone, but we might be able to stream this out to other classrooms at the same time. Um, you know, the State Parks was doing this with very complex and very expensive equipment. I'm trying to remember the name of the program they had, but they were doing the, that. The Ports program. Ports, that's right. And it was, but it was very, you know, it was, it was a full on production uh, here. We're doing it now. Our naturalists have done this with handheld equipment, um, I'm, I'm really proud of them. You know, the, the biggest message I think that comes out of this is that we're being part, a really big part of the solution for both teachers and for parents. And I think that's a big, big uh, goal here. And the staff has done a really great job. You know, we were just at the edge of the digital work. Um, Kevin Damster was doing a lot of it with the Mobile Visitor Center. But at that point, we had done enough where we were able to pivot and I think we've been an important uh, part of that solution during the pandemic and the remote teaching. So really proud of staff. Yeah, uh, one, one other group I think that might, might uh, even though they're, I think one other group that could definitely benefit too are, are our seniors, mm -hmm. uh, senior centers. Um, so, cause there a lot of them are really isolated right now and, um, uh, if they could outreach to these little programs on their own or through their through a group, uh, be fabulous. Right. That that's a very good point. We we actually have done some uh, virtual live programs for groups other than schools, and we are offering them out. It's part of our overall digital learning plan. So the school programming is one element. That's a, a core audience for us, but also the other community groups seniors, veterans that uh, could benefit from a live uh, naturalist program, we are developing those and offering those out uh, as part of our overall effort. Fabulous. Carry on. Kessler, <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you like to say, say anything? I, mean, I never get a chance to see you, so... To... <laughs> Well, Ann Kassebaum, Chief of Interpretive and Recreation Services, I, I popped in when you began to ask the question about data collection, and Ira did a great job of, of answering that. And we are collecting that information for you, uh, Director Rosario, because I know you made a comment in the last board meeting. Um, yes. So, and, and we collect that information on, on a monthly basis. Uh, the other thing is that the new um, software that, that we have purchased for um, uh, teachers and, and groups to request programs is really going to allow us to capture that data um, and, and also do a lot more mapping and areas of, areas of discovery in which um, maybe we aren't hitting uh, or, or reaching out to uh, schools that we should be because they don't know about us or know what we offer and um, really wanna collect that data in a, in a consistent manner so that we can query it and get information to you quickly. Great, thank you so much. I mean, uh, uh, the impetus is that for that is I have a couple of very uh, 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 engaged constituents, and uh, they, they're looking at our our our, our financial goals. Of uh, one of them was outreach and diversity, and they, you know, they want us to show our, show us show our work. And so that's uh, that's something I've always asked for. Is you know, uh, if you have a goal, show your work. And then, um, so this will be a, a, a great way to, uh, to segue in, into, the, into the future. So thank you so Thanks. much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And, and I just, if I can say, I am so proud as, as, as we all are of our interpretive staff and the work that they've done on 
on these types of resources for teachers. Um, the, the creativity and the dedication to providing these valuable resources to, to schools, to community groups, to families. We have gotten so many uh, emails and posts on our Facebook, different Facebook pages, thanking us for the different series of pre-recorded and live uh, programs that we're putting out right now. And it's, it's really filling a need that is, is out there in the community. Thank you so much. We are, yes, we are indeed all very proud uh, of the work and our staff. It's, it's great, fabulous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have uh, number four, Dumbarton Quarry Campground on the Bay Operational Plan. I've heard of that. All right, I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, uh, I want to do a quick introduction before I hand it over to um, you know, Manager Vance and uh, our Park Supervisor, Matt McDonald. But very quickly, as um, I had a chance to get out there with uh, Dave and Matt and, and Steve Castile, our Chief of Park Operations, uh, probably almost three or four weeks ago now. And, uh, and Director Wieskamp, it actually is a reality. It, it looks beautiful. Uh, okay, Matt, you're not great. trying to fool me. <laughs> yeah, no. This, this is exactly why we're here today, Director Wieskamp. Oh, just did that. I appreciate sure you knew it was actually happening. And, and Matt has been doing a really great job, uh, along with Kim Collins and the ASD group, the DECO group, uh, of guiding our, uh, our, our um, operator out there. And it's really coming along well and the, and the quality work is really great. So uh, I hope you'll enjoy uh, Matt's presentation. With that, I'll hand it off to Dave and Matt. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, Board of Directors, WASPI, Rosario Weisskamp, uh, AGM O'Connor. Um, I'm Dave Vance, I'm the Lake Sheena Manager. I'm here to present with Matt McDonald, Park Supervisor, Coyote Hills on the operation of Dumbarton Quarry uh, campground on the bay. So uh, I'll turn it over to Matt so we can start his presentation. Are you all seeing my uh, screen? We see you. Okay. Are you seeing Not my yet. screen for the slideshow? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. We're looking at you. Okay. Let me try that again. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Share screen. Screen two. And the little button over in the lower left or lower right that says share. Share. I think Jim does a few of these. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. And then from the beginning. And switch. All right. Are you seeing the full slideshow and not the notes? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, board members and AGM O'Connor. This photo shows a view of Coyote Hills before the quarry was started and at the time of the Nike missile base. In the upper section here is where the quarry operations were conducted and you can see the original hill. For reference, this stand of eucalyptus that you see right here can be seen from Lake Chabot. Can we just stop for a second, Matt? Because yeah. uh, this is a really incredible photo because hey, you know, we've wonderful. been talking We've been talking about rebuilding that hill, at least some semblance of that hill, but this picture is amazing because it shows that, that real ridge line that went down to the toll plaza. This was where the uh, missiles were stored and this is where the visitor center is at. And this is what some people call Radio Hill where the uh, radio towers are located. So that gives you some reference. So in the initial quarry operations began in the 19, early, uh, late 1950s and early 1960s. In 1977, Dumbart Dumbarton Quarry Associates, a division of DeSilva Gates Construction, received a 20-year mining permit from the city of Fremont, contingent that at the end of the 20 years, DQA would build a campground and park wholly owned and operated by the East Bay Regional Park District. At the end of the 20-year permit in 1997, DQA asked for a 10-year extension, which was granted. In 2006, quarry operations ceased. EBRPD then began working with Dumbarton Quarry Associates to develop the plan for the campground. This became part of the legal agreement between DQA and EBRPD. The quarry operation excavated a 190 foot hill down to 350 feet below sea level and 22 acres across. Approximately 6 million cubic yards of fill were used to fill the hole. By 2018, much of the former quarry was filled. Hey Matt? Yes, sir. 
Go, can you go back to that picture that shows the quarry at its full build out? The, I mean, that is, yeah, the, this, the next one back. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I think it's really amazing. Uh, and I, if I hope you don't mind, Chair Rosario, just to take a second here, but this, yeah. this hole that you're looking at was the lowest point in North America at one point, lower than Badwater and Death Valley. And when you see the slides later on that Matt has of pictures, it's just amazing. And this is this has occurred generally in the time that I've been with the district, which is about nine and a half years. And I'm just amazed at this transformation. I just wanted to point that out that for those of us, those in the audience that hadn't uh, hadn't known that before, but this was the lowest point in North America at one point. Hey, Matt. Amazing. The initial planning stages of DQA wanted to take, make a lake at the quarry and proposals were given for 50 and 25 foot deep lakes, which EVRPD declined. They were safety issues and no ability to refresh the lake and it went in a, would have ended up as a stagnant pond. After negotiations, a meadow, which you see here, was, was agreed upon and the project was split into two phases to allow for the filling of the old quarry while camping could begin. I will discuss the phases in the next slide. When the engineers discovered that the meadow would, be, would settle and be difficult to use or maintain, DQA proposed to restore the original hill to 190 feet, which you see here, which would resolve the settling issue of the meadow. Restoring the ridgeline will require 4 million cubic yards of fill in addition to the 6 million to fill the hole. And this is the park layout that we are working towards. Phase one on this side will have a kiosk, five reservable picnic sites here, 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 and here, um, a playground with equipment located right here, and there'll be play structures in that area. There'll be two bathrooms for day use, one located here and one located up here. There will be uh, 63 campsites located in this area, 60 with full RV hookups of sewer, water, and electrical, and three unpaved sites with water only located here. There are two shower restroom buildings for the campers located here and here, a camp store, an amphitheater, and the service yard. Phase two will have 25 to 28 convenience camping spots located here, 20 car campsites here, and two group campsites, one of 150 and one of 75. Each of these camp group campsites can be further to subdivide, subdivided as we need it. And there are also three shower restroom buildings in phase two for the camping here, here, and here. The entire park will eventually have Wi-Fi access for the public. Dumbarton Quarry Campground will staff will be the combined staff of Coyote Hills and Dumbarton to operate both parks. Coyote Hills has a supervisor, myself, a gardener, three 12-month rangers, and one seasonal gate attendant. Staff was increased to add in one parks craft specialist, two rangers, three park service workers, and all but two of the, of the PSWs have been hired. The naturalists will also be adding a 0.25 naturalist position, and there are additional partial positions for trades and public safety. Equipment has been added for the Dumbarton Quarry Campground to include one Chevy Colorado, one rear loading garbage truck like Del Val, one single deck mower, and we're greening the fleet with two Polaris Rangers, one you can see here. The electric Polaris Rangers are really popular with the staff because of their ease of use and how quiet they are, and the charge lasts quite a long time. A service yard is being planned and will be completed in the winter of 2021 or 2022. It will have an office and attached shop and is being designed to use something similar to a prefab Butler building. One side will house the offices, which will be located here and here, a kitchen, a main room, and a bathroom, locker room, and shower. The other half of the building will be a workshop located behind this bay door. And there are two drive-through bay doors located here and here. The, sh the shop will also contain a bathroom, a washer, dryer, and an eyewash station. This is our site plan. From the upper left, there's a link, there's a gate, a chain link gate that the staff will come into to a garbage ramp here and three 30 yard dumps, dumpsters. There'll be four bins for materials such as de, uh, decomposed granite or rock. We also have a biodiesel fuel storage area here and two uh, storage containers, uh, cargo containers for storage. We will also have uh, equipment and vehicle parking for district vehicles here. And located here will be a vehicle wash station with a cover over the top of it. Staff parking will be located on this side. And behind the building, there'll be containers for integrated pest management, storage, 
fuel for chainsaws, an air compressor and such. And these are the two drive-through bay doors to let you know. This building's about 40 feet long. So we'll actually be able to put together a truck and a trailer for transport and storage if we need to. The project has been delayed three times. The first was two months in 2017 due to excessive rains and flooding. There were three months in 2018 due to equipment being transferred to assist with the Tubbs fire. And there was one month at the beginning of the pandemic. And this is where we are today. The first building that you see here is the kiosk. The second building that's located over here is the day use bathroom located right next to the playground, which you can see in this area. The next two buildings are the showers and bathrooms for the campers. This is the amphitheater for the naturalist programs with a fire pit. Uh, to let you know, there's no gas in the park. It's all electric. So this, this fire pit will be a wood burning fire pit. This last building is the camp store. Here are four ADA camping spots located here. And either one of these sites or this site will be used for a camp host. There's one additional day use bathroom located down here that's not visible in this photo. And this shows the, 60, the 63 sites. Here are the 60 and these are the three that are unpaved. So I wanted to reiterate what, what you see in our plans, the, surface, the service yard, the kiosk, the camp store and the amphitheater. And this is phase two where the hill will begin. And here we have a view taken from Eagle. So to reiterate, the kiosk is down here, the camp store is here and the amphitheater is here. And this area is the hill that you can see the hole has been filled in and it's actually several stories tall now. We look up to it and not down into it. The camp located next to the amphitheater, this area will contain the, um, the convenience camping. This area approximately will be the car camping and the two group campsites will be located about here with the service yard in this area. Um, I would like to mention and thank Kim Collins, the district landscape artist, architect, artist, she is an artist too, uh, heading this project. She's been an advocate for the district to get the highest quality park we can get. Her efforts have been Herculean and Sisyphean. She has physically and metaphorically moved boulders from this former quarry. And the district and park staff will never be able to sufficiently thank her for her work to build a park that will be manageable and one that we can maintain. And at that, I thank you for your time and are there any questions? You know, I bet you Director Wieskamp has some questions. You know, <laughs> I, I believe I am so impressed to actually be there. I'm just going to have to go over. Is it possible to drive through if you wish to do it? Sometime? Yes, it is, Director. Uh, um, with the proper safety guidelines, I would be able to actually take you in one of our district vehicles. So you Yay. just let me know when you want to go. Well, well, it's, in, it's we'll interesting. We'll set up for you, Director Wieskamp. We'll, we'll take care of that. Okay. Uh, no, I was talking to Ben Yee earlier this week, and he said he was at lunch with the mayor, and the mayor wanted to know how was it coming along. Oh, it's coming. I assured her that we were working on it again, and that I had high hopes that this coming year will be the year. There so, is no doubt, ma'am. And okay. let's given another monkey wrench in life. <laughs> I am going to be optimistic. Thank you so much. It's going to be exciting for a lot of people. Actually, the mayor of Newark is looking forward to it because all those people who rent those RVs have to go light somewhere for 24 hours, and this is going to be perfect. So I'm sure it'll be full quickly. Yes. People coming to see the world. And I thanks for the uh, historical perspective. I think it was good to see it again as it was. And that first picture was quite impressive. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate it, Matt. My pleasure. Thank you. Director Waspy. Uh, nothing other than beautiful. I can't wait. It's, it's, uh, it's an amazing, <laughs> uh, amazing feat. Uh, and congratulations to everybody. Especially Kim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, this... Go ahead. I'm no, sorry. go ahead, director. Uh, uh, all I was going to say, this is pretty fabulous. Uh, my only question regarding the service yard: I didn't see any charging stations for possibility of uh, when we, if the, uh, we go electric with uh, with our, some of our vehicles. There will is be there... one. 
if you let me go back to the, uh, the uh, site service uh, site plan, I can show you where that is. Thinking ahead. Yeah. Yes, we are. Oops. <laughs> no, no, Sorry. I'll take that right one. here. Uh, right here, director, is where the uh, charging station is going to be at. The, those, these will be ADA spots, and there'll be electric charging station right here. Additionally, the uh, the Polaris's that we have are just on 110. We actually have a, a, a permanent setup here in the Coyote Hills service yard, and we'll be storing those inside the building and charging them inside the building. And Matt, okay. and then is that a go ahead. Matt, is that a level two charging station, the one that's on the exterior? Uh, you'll have to forgive me, I don't know. Okay. Find out later. Yeah, as long as that's, uh, uh, that's expandable and as, as we electrify our fleet. And then the other question is, do we, uh, do we have charging stations for the public? Yes, we do, Director. Excellent, how many? Uh, I believe there are five to 10. I can't give you the exact number right now. Okay. Oh, good. I, when I visit, I can plug in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we are planning. We are planning. And also, I, I'd like to point out um, to the to the committee members this this design for the new um, this service yard is really going to stand be our standard design for future development of service yards. So. Um, this is exciting for us as a staff because we're getting to test out this design and uh, see how it works. But um, this, this is the single building concept where we have our shop and offices combined in one um, uh, one metal prefab building. So we're, we're really excited about uh, having this one go forward because I think it's going to be a great model for the future uh, when we're able to replace other uh, service yards. Uh, for reference, it's going to look similar to what East County Trails has yep. for their service. Right, which is nice. I have a question. Yes, please. Maybe Dr. a Reese. comment. You know, we were all impressed by that first photograph. Why don't we ask Carol Johnson if someone in the department can work up a pamphlet or whatever? Because I think the history of this place is going to be fascinating for those people who come. And I can see them wanting to take something back with them, saying, this is where it was, this is what it is now. And it would be, we're so good at putting together books, journals, whatever, but impressive photographs and planning and why we change things. I, I think that would be just really terrific. And Matt is ready for that new building, aren't you, Matt? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be nice to get out of what, my office, which I refer to as the <laughs> Hobbit hut. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that photograph. Director it's Wieskamp, good. you're exactly right, is that this does have a, it's an amazing history. And, you know, we have a we have a strong history of doing these um, full circle, what I call full circle turnarounds, right? right? We had a natural area, it was turned industrial, and then we're turning it back in the parkland. And I think that's one of the great stories of the park district all along mm -hmm. the shoreline. And it's just another one of those great stories about the conversion back to parkland for the people. So it's a great story. Thank you uh, for mentioning that. Yeah, I just think it's gonna be great to people see the transition and why we change the plan as we learn more and said, oh, can't do it that way, we go to the next one. And then whoever thought we were gonna be building the hill back when uh, we well, start. AJM O'Connor and directors, uh, to that AJM O'Connor's point, this here was where the missiles were at and it's okay. a rebuilt hill by the district. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. was done after our acquisition in 1968. So wow. the, this missile site is no longer visible to the public. It's buried under about 20 feet of earth. Okay. We take it down and we build it up. Yes. Very Fabulous. nice. Thank you. I will stop sharing my screen. Well, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. We appreciate you being here. Uh, Chief Castile. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Well, hi, directors. Hey, Jim O'Connor. I uh, just wanted to also say that, um, you know, Mac gives a lot of credit to others, but this has been an ongoing weekly meeting um, and he's been an integral part of this. Um, I've attended uh, you know, some of the meetings as of late and uh, even the entire ASD crew um, who's been involved in this, um, it's basically going over the plans, going over the plans, making adjustments, whether it be to the um, infrastructure, you know, whether it be electrical or sewage or culverts and how they're placing it 
Because every time you change one thing, it changes 10 other things on the plans. And then being able to catch that prior to a going in at the beginning stages is really the critical parts for the overall development of the park. And uh, it's just been an incredible journey watching, you know, how this has all come together as, you know, pretty much a team within operations and ASD um, as a whole. So it's, it's something that's working out really well. But thank you, Steve. It is. Jim O'Connor. Um, I want to tag on to what um, Steve just said is that um, Matt, between Matt and Kim, um, we're getting, I think, a really high quality product. When I was out there, because I've been involved in so many park projects and had to fix so many uh, park projects over the years, um, they're really paying attention to some details. I mean, the simplest thing, like we're gonna have a, a concrete curb around the de, uh, decomposed granite, which is at the base underneath the tables. And as something as simple as that, I mean, we fought for that, but it's gonna reduce staff time, work time, and the quality look of the facility is amazing. Um, the GM, GM Doyle continuously said that this was gonna be a higher end uh, facility, and it really is turning out that way. Just the quality of the work is amazing. Part of that is that, you know, working with Matt and working with Kim as we've gotten the, the DQM uh, team also to understand like, hey, this is really a unique thing. We're building a brand new park. And I think they've bought into that vision and uh, I think they're, they're running with it and it's gonna be a really high quality facility. So we're very excited about it. Yes. Any other comments? Any I won't have to ask about it for a while. Whoopee. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. David, Thank anything you, David. David, anything else to, to add? You to manage your fence? No, I, I, I appreciate what Matt's been doing, Kim. On my end, it, it makes my job a little easier. Um, but I, I also have uh, been sitting in the meetings too and, and hearing the conversations going back and forth and, and my site visits going out there. I don't get there all, all the time, but when I do go out there, I see progression and it's amazing what's turning out and like AGM O'Connor says it's it's amazing the quality of work that we're getting so much appreciated great from well, the boots on like the ground a, we don't we don't get to build a brand new park that often but it seems like we've got a few down the road so uh, this will be a good template for uh, for our future parks like Concord and oh, Naval, yeah. Weapon, Naval Air Station so yes Congratulations to everyone and I thank you all for your incredible work and attention to detail. Yes. Sure. Okay, thank you so much. Wow. This is a good news. Um, <laughs> a good news meeting. The world needs more of that. <laughs> the country. Needs. Okay. Item number five, uh, park operations, parkland unit update. My home, my home unit. <laughs> Hi there, uh, Dan Sykes here, Parkland Unit Manager. Um, I am uh, here today to present a uh, Parkland Unit update. And um, you can see behind me on my screen, I brought some guests along with me. <laughs> These are the uh, members of the Parkland Unit um, who do all the work to, to make me look good and make the Park District look good. Um, this is an interesting segue looking at one of the newer future parks of the district. And now you have an opportunity to take a walk with me through some of the parks that are the oldest parks in the, uh, in the park district. Um, so uh, welcome to the Brazil building, or at least that's where <laughs> my staff is. I'm at home in Alameda, just like all of you. Um, but I'm representing all these people who, who do all this, uh, who've done a lot of really great work that I'd like to present today. So I'm going to share uh, up on my screen a uh, presentation I have for you today. Okay. Um, the uh, I think we all know the story of 2019 and 2020 at the Park District has been dominated by uh, news of fires and smoke and park closures. And district-wide, we've really needed to focus on how to keep the parks open safely and serve the public. And we've also faced a big challenge in the staffing due to retirements and, and transfers. 
So the story I wanted to tell you today, though, is about the important park work that's going along in the Parkland unit behind the scenes that's been happening despite all this. And um, I'll give you a brief overview of some of those projects and activities today. Uh, and to start off today, this uh, the picture here, this is L Ranger Lance Hostetler, who's working out on the stream trail in Reinhardt Redwood Park. The uh, story is uh, really a story of building and repairing and managing resources over the last couple of years since the last opportunity I've had to come to talk to the Board Operations Committee. We've been developing park crews, uh, repairing our trails and infrastructure, project, uh, helping with projects to, that will improve the environment and uh, facilitating projects by the crews in our parks and in in the Botanic Garden as well as doing some of that day-to-day uh, -day necessary work in vegetation and forest management. And of course, uh, the story of COVID is uh, preparing to reopen facilities. So I wanna start with just reviewing the new park supervisors uh, on my team. The Parkland unit has seven park supervisors. The Parkland unit is shown over here on the right side of the screen. Uh, these are the uh, all six units in the um, park Operations Department. And of those six, I have a, uh, out of those seven, uh, excuse me, out of those, out of the seven park supervisors in the unit, four of them have been newly hired within the last one and a half years. And that has really been a big change for our team, but it's also been a great opportunity to bring in some new ideas and energy, new skill sets, new um, ways of doing things. Most of my supervisor team has turned over and they're new to their roles yet they have been able to adapt to the current challenges and we are working well together. They've also managed to accomplish a lot of great work and crew development during that time. So uh, just to introduce them again, Bridget Calvi uh, is the new supervisor, relatively new supervisor at Reinhardt Redwood Park, Dave Weaver at Tilden Park, Steve Donnelly at Wildcat Canyon and Alvarado Parks, and Sarah Miracle Kite at Anthony Chabot and Leona Open Space. First thing I want to talk, touch on is the park crew development that's been going on. We've been assessing the park crews uh, with our new supervisors and they've been finding opportunities to develop new skills among their staff through training. Some recent examples uh, that we've been able to do both uh, remotely and in person uh, are first of all, the training that's shown here on the picture on your left is a uh, staff training done at Wildcat Canyon Park where we brought in Jim Clark, an arborist to uh, teach us about sudden oak death. And then on the right is a picture of some hands-on training in new equipment uh, in the park. Uh, this is what the green climber remote control mower. Some other examples are the COVID-19 safety protocols that we've been doing online training in, as well as webinars sponsored by UCSF about how to operate parks safely during COVID. And finally, uh, training and grazing management, which has also been done online. Then jumping over to some trail improvement work that's been going on. Here's a great example, Wildcat and Wildcat Canyon Park. The Wildcat Creek Trail is the main connection between Tilden Park and Wildcat Canyon running along Wildcat Creek. And it's historically been prone to seasonal mud and poor vehicle access. As you can see the pictures on the left there, um, deep ruts in the trail and um, due to uh, when it gets wet, it gets uh, very impassable. We also were hit pretty hard during 2016 and 2017, worst when storms washed out culverts that had to be replaced. And parts of the trail were closed for about two years. So we were fortunate in the last couple of years to be able to make good on the use of some Measure CC money, which promised to gravel the uh, trail in, um, for a two and a half mile length, as well as taking advantage of some graveling work that PG&E wanted to do so they could get better access to their towers. And that work was fortunately all done at no cost to the park district. Hmm. As we were doing the work um, on the far right, you can see the, the results. We took, we paid attention to the aesthetics of the trail so that the trail would continue to offer a great user experience. So in some locations, we added hydro seating shown here on this, uh, the middle picture. We added hydro seating, uh, to encourage the growth of vegetation and grass along the shoulders in some sections. Uh, we had to do this in some areas where the contractor had to grade a little bit wider to correct some historic drainage problems. 
but our goal that we achieved was to aim to was to uh, create a 14 foot width for at um, can fit uh, emergency vehicle access as well as trail use. And you can see on the far right the uh, success of our hydro seeding effort um, with the uh, uh, with the grasses growing in on the shoulder. I want to jump in just for a minute there, Dan. Um, I want to, can we go back to that slide for a minute? Uh, directors, I want to make a point here is we had some public outcry over the work that was done here uh, on this trail, uh, mostly around the width of the trail. Um, you know, those of us have done the work in parks like this for years and years, we know that, you know, uh, it doesn't take very long, a year or two after you do a project like this for the vegetation to come back. And so the idea is you do build slightly wider uh, to stabilize the trail and then eventually the vegetation comes back in and you get your final trail width. And that's how you, that, you know, so it's a really important point that we did this correctly. And, and you know, it's, it's difficult for the public to see when you do the, a brand new work like that. It's raw, uh, it's wide, uh, but what happens is it only takes a year or two and you get back to what is a reasonable trail. But now this trail, we've, it's revegetated to the inside width, but it's stable, very stable on the outside, and therefore its long its longevity is extended. So, just wanted to point that out because it was it was controversial at the time we did it. So, but uh, in the end, we've gotten exactly what we were talking about and looking for. So, nice work to Dan and his staff. Continue on. We've also had the opportunity in the last uh, just very recently to see some trail repairs happen due to storm damage that happened during this, the the uh, emergency storm events of 2017. And we were promised FEMA funding, uh, for Federal Emergency Management Agency funding for that. And that money has come through. And uh, the FEMA crews are out working right now, or I should say the contractor crews are working out right now with FEMA funding. And uh, this is an example of one of the projects at uh, Brandon Trail in Anthony Chabot Park. Other locations uh, repaired in Anthony Chabot are uh, the Columbine Trail, and the Red Tail Trail, as well as at Wildcat Canyon Park. Um, work's just been completed at the Nimitz Way Trail. Oh, and I should also say the East Ridge Trail at, at Redwood Park as well. So uh, along with the, the trail work, there's been efforts to replace infrastructure recently. And uh, one great example of the aging infrastructure that we have in the Park Lane unit is the main water line that brings us our water into Reinhardt Redwood Park. The park gets all of its East Bay mud water for all of its water fountains, restrooms, its two offices, fire station two, and a park residence, all from a single line that runs for about three and a half miles under the stream trail. And it comes all the way from uh, the north end of the park at uh, Skyline Boulevard to the south end. So due to this, the length of the trail and the fact that it had been um, uh, due to its age, the water line had started having frequent leaks, breaks, and water pressure problems. Probably, uh, Director Rosaro, you can attest to this. Uh, and as funding has been available over the last um, uh, two decades, the pipeline has been replaced in sections. And in 2019, uh, we were uh, fortunate to see the final section of that uh, pipeline replaced with Measure CC funds. And so the final one half mile section of old galvanized steel water pipe has been replaced with new C900 plastic pipe. And shown here, this is, uh, it's laid out on the trail, um, on stream trail, and that right before it was uh, dug in and buried under the trail. So this is a very durable pipe material, uh, easy to repair and should last for a good long time. So Some projects to improve the environment have been going along in the Park Lane unit as well. These have been led through, these are district-wide efforts uh, directed by the design and construction department. Uh, and uh, some couple examples of this. In um, 2020, we just saw the installation of a oxygenation system at Tilden Park at Lake Anza. And you can see here there on the left picture, they're installing the pipeline with about 500 feet of pipeline into the, the lake. And um, this will deliver oxygen to the bottom of the lake which helps to prevent the growth of blue-green algae. And as you know, blue-green algae is one of our difficult challenges because when it becomes, uh, starts releasing toxins, it need, requires us to close the lake. So we're hoping uh, that we'll be um, doing something where we can manage this better in the future. 
On the right is pictured the uh, McCosker property, which is uh, part of Sibley Preserve. And this project kicked off in uh, early summer of 2020 and is now in full operation. The aim being to restore a creek that will be called Alder Creek. And uh, at this location, this picture we're looking at, the hole on, my, on the right is about 30 feet deep, 30 feet below the current ground level which was dug out to create a natural creek channel in a location where the creek had been previously culverted into pipes. And then all of the earth that's dug out of this area will be uh, used to build up a group campground um, elsewhere on the site. Another couple examples of projects to improve the environment. Uh, we're talking about the Nike missile site at Coyote Hills. There was one up on San Pablo Ridge too. And this one uh, was located at Wildcat Canyon Park. So pictured here on the left is um, a uh, underground fuel storage tank. So Wildcat Canyon Park staff and the stewardship department have been working for several years with US Army Corps of Engineers to complete the final removal of the infrastructure that was put in place at the Nike missile site. Um, the, uh, there were missile silos, a radar installation, and military barracks at this site, which um, was decommissioned in the 1960s. And even though the missiles and the, uh, all the other above ground infrastructure was removed, these tanks were the last piece of, of uh, infrastructure that needed to come out. So in a, um, this project included um, taking these three tanks, ranging from 1600 to 10,000 gallons in size, um, digging them up, rinsing them, and removing them. And the liquid that was, um, was taken out was disposed of offsite, and the tanks were crushed and sent to a recycler. And then the holes were then filled in and um, the site was restored. And on the right side here, uh, a fun project that, um, the, that Jim Rutledge, a supervisor at um, Sibley, uh, and his crew have been um, very proud of. And that's to uh, plant new trees at Sibley uh, Preserve uh, next to the Round Top Loop Trail. And they've invited in volunteer groups such as this one to plant these redwood trees in a location where eucalyptus has been removed as part of um, fuel management projects. And redwood trees, of course, are known for their ability to sequester, sequester carbon, which um, helps combat climate change. So the project there totaled 225 trees that were planted. Another neat project that has been going on um, in Reinhardt Redwood Park. We have been fortunate that we've got a couple real uh, stars on that crew that are um, very well versed in trail maintenance. And um, so the crew's been leading an effort to improve several trails. Um, in this picture you see on the far left is Stream Trail um, and uh, a project there to replace some of the um, aging um, split rail fence that uh, protects Redwood Creek, as well as in the middle um, projects that uh, added rock reinforcement to the trail to, uh, in, to um, extend its life, as well as uh, outsloping for better drainage and um, uh, some other locations in the park that have been uh, treated have been on the Golden Spike Trail, Bridal Trail, East Ridge, and Prince Trails. So a lot of work's been done on the trails. And this is... Um, uh, been really assisted by the use of uh, equipment such as the mini tractor, which is shown here on your right. This is called a Toro Dingo, if you haven't seen one before, and the operator rides on the back of it, actually. Uh, and um, it was purchased in 2020 with board support, which we wanted to say thank you for. Over at the Botanic Garden, the Regional Parks Botanic Garden, they've also been busy. They added a new exhibit, which was completed in 2020. It is a rock garden in the Sierra section of the garden. Uh, it was a three year effort to plan this, purchase the stone and install it. It is called a Sierra crevice garden. The uh, roads and trails crew um, was really vital in this. They um, are the ones who laid out all the, the stone and moved it around. We couldn't have done it without them. It was a great collaborative project. The exhibit mimics the mountainous environment of the High Sierra Range, where specialized native plants grow in small crevices in the rocks where soil and water have collected. So they call it a crevice garden. 
and it continues to add to the several rock exhibits that are in the Botanic Garden, which was recognized in 2020 with an award for this. They uh, received the Frank Cabot Public Rock Gar uh, Garden Award from the North American Rock Garden Society. And then over on the right is pictured uh, a bridge railing. So if you've been to the Botanic Garden, you know it has a number of uh, old um, stone bridges that go over the uh, go over Wildcat Creek. And uh, staff has led projects to install two railings um, on two of these bridges that were funded um, through the Friends of the Botanic Garden. One of them that's pictured here has a salmon motif and I'm gonna run my cursor over right in the middle where you can see salmon yeah. migrating upstream here. Um, these are represent one of the wildlife elements of the klamath Siskiyou region of California, which is where the native plants come from that are located in this section of the garden. And then next to that, um, there's also a second bridge was given railings with newts on them, which are emblematic of course of our uh, Friends in Wildcat Creek. Dan, uh, were those, we, were those railings, yeah. Dan, were those railings uh, uh, built by staff or uh, was it a commission? It, they were commissioned uh, by a contractor there. Oh, ah, yeah. okay. Fabulous. I want to jump over to Tilden uh, Park where we have been um, able to uh, do some playground renovations. Uh, on the left here, it's shown a chain link fence that was added around the playground at the um, Indian camp picnic area uh, and, uh, the, and a new slide that was installed to replace one that was deteriorated. Since it is next to the little farm, this location is very popular with toddlers and their parents. So the fence is a safety barrier between the play structure and the parking lot, which you can see just uh, in the back uh, middle ground of this picture on the left. And then in addition to that, <clears throat> the playground surface has gotten a lot of wear and that was also refurbished. And over at Wildcat Canyon Park, the playground at the Alvarado picnic area uh, received a new swing set shown on the left here and uh, a flex coat seal was applied to the rubber surface to extend its life. As I mentioned, one of the things that we're always doing in the parkland unit is vegetation management. That includes weed abatement along roads, trails, behind homes. And uh, since we have a lot of wildland urban interface, we need to be really cognizant of that. Projects uh, have been going on a lot, um, where we've partnered with the fire department on fuels management projects, such as the one shown in the center here, a roadside cleanup here um, with, our, with a chipper. And then, uh, of course, hand removal is another method that um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, vegetation management gets uh, finished by. And, but in addition to that, we have um, this work has been made more efficient in this year by uh, using new equipment that has been brought on board for the Parkland unit. I just wanted to um, uh, thank again the board for your support of uh, the purchase of these pieces of equipment. That includes the uh, walk behind flail mower shown here on the right side, which handles some of that larger material that can't be handled by, uh, by the turf mower, uh, as well as chippers at Anthony Chabot and Sibley Preserve. And uh, the Toro Dingo I picked was pictured earlier at Reinhardt Redwood. Flail mower attachments for the turf mowers that we have at all of our parks and uh, a skid steer tractor, which was purchased for Sibley Preserve, which will really help with the Western Hills open space addition there. And then finally, the new uh, green climber, which is a remote controlled mower, which uh, was pictured earlier and is um, uh, stored at Tilden and used at all the Park Lane Unit parks. We also continue with our wow. forest management project. Oh, sorry. Did somebody have a comment? Okay, I'll keep going. We also continue with our forest management. And uh, in 2019, 128 hazardous trees were removed or pruned throughout the unit. Uh, and in 2020, we're at, uh, we have removed 77 trees so far. And as you can see on the left and right here, uh, here's an example of a tree that fell over right next to the Alvarado picnic area. And then uh, on the right here, this is an aging pine uh, along the Goldenrod Trail at Anthony Chabot. Uh, and it's just 
just shows an example of uh, a lot of the aging trees that, that we're having to um, manage in the unit. And then the, the last piece of my presentation, I just wanted to comment um, that, of course, with uh, COVID-19, uh, a lot of the focus of our staff has been on how to run things uh, safely and then how to reopen facilities as we can. And we just had a successful reopening of the Anthony Chabot Family Campground on October 2nd. And, uh, but that required a lot of work um, up from staff to prepare the site. That include marking half of the campsites as closed, which is seen here on the left side with these delineators and signs. We also covered up the tables and the closed sites and set up the restrooms with social distance markings and signs and installed plexiglass sneeze guards, uh, a sneeze guard in the kiosk and uh, taught all our staff the, um, the uh, safety protocols so that um, the parks can be operated safely. And that concludes my overview of the Park Lane Unit Update. And uh, if I or any of the people in this picture here can answer your questions, please, uh, please let me know. I'll uh, stop sharing my screen now. Quite a crew. We'll start with uh, Director Wieskamp. You know, very impressive. Uh, I can't imagine how many projects you must have going at the same time. <laughs> yes. A lot of work keeping track of. I, I believe you are. What is a flailing lawnmower? A flail mower, okay. So yeah. uh, the flail mower is set up, it has a, a blade that rotates like this versus uh -huh. uh, the turf mowers that, that run in a horizontal way. Right. And the advantage of the flail mowers is that you can really get into some of the larger um, coyote brush, um, hemlock, some of the thicker stalked how's it, um, how vegetation? big a bush can it attack? Um, I've seen it go through material that's five, six feet tall. Wow. It's really sad to see all of those trees going, but I guess it's not a surprise. And just keeping up and keeping them, people in picnic areas and so on safe and on the trail, so. Right, it's, and it's, it's a natural condition. Some of it, of course, is due to sudden oak death, which has been a real struggle right. for us. We're really uh, spending a lot of time dealing with that. So um, coast live oaks have been hit particularly hard. Um, but then in addition to that, a lot of the Monterey pines that were planted in the area have just aged out. They're just, they're 80, 90 years old, and um, they're just beginning to die. <laughs> Well, tell that smiling crew of yours behind you that they're doing a great job because they obviously are. I, thanks for the photo. It, it's nice to see people, <laughs> you know. We know they're out there doing all of this stuff, but we don't get to be around them all the time. So thank you very much. I appreciate sure it. Enough. Director Waspy. Well, yeah, thanks, Dan, for the presentation. You guys are doing obviously great work. and. and and it's a great opportunity. And so the only thing I would reiterate is I, I, I do notice that a lot of those big giant projects have to be done by a contractor and some of the specialized projects have to be done by contractors. But I appreciate the fact that you let your staff get out there every once in a while and um, do projects. I know when I was a park ranger, doing a project was really, really important. I mean, you can really get burned out picking up litter <laughs> your life, uh, which isn't in some cases very fulfilling, but to get out and do a project that you'll see every day and be able to take pride in and show your family and show the people um, you're, you're representing and your, your clientele, it, it really makes total sense. And, and I've always felt that in having done this, um, people would do the work in-house, do a, or take much more pride in their work and do a better job in my opinion. And I, I'm very happy that you're, you're you're doing that type of stuff, so I appreciate it. Well, thank you for mentioning that, Director Waspy. That that has really been a key component of my, my time as the Parkland Unit Manager. I've really valued and and been um, uh, supporting that among my staff when they are ready to go out there and try new projects and go to training and learn get some of these specialized skills. Um, you know, the the trail maintenance work that's been being done at um, Reinhardt Redwood is is particularly um, a, a great. Um, you know, uh, commitment to, you know, to the future. And uh, we've got staff at all the parks that have great skills in chainsaw and 
in building things and repairing um, uh, park infrastructure. And that's something I really look for when I, when I hire new staff. Good job. Great. Uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's amazing to see how much work that has been done in the unit and especially in, in this last couple of years and especially with COVID. And uh, a question for you is, uh, 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 staff-wise, uh, are, your, are your parks uh, fully staffed? And uh, how, has, how has COVID affected uh, staffing levels there at, at, your, at, your, at your unit? That's a good question. Uh, we are almost fully staffed. Um, we have um, one vacancy that we are um, that we're hiring for right now at Wildcat Canyon due to a transfer. Um, and and uh, among staff with COVID, we have worked really hard to adjust schedules so that we can keep everybody um, uh, working and employed, and it works with their particular, you know, personal life situations, childcare, etc. We do have a couple um, uh, that have been on um, leaves, and due to the districts um, being able to provide FF care, uh, the Families First Care programs, and that sort of thing. Um, we, so we've had we've had a few vacancies during that period, um, during during the period on because of that basis. But for the most part, our staff has been. Um, uh, either uh, you know, mostly full-time or uh, full-time um, all the way through the, the COVID epidemic. Wow, good. And then um, uh, regarding the campground, uh, I, I uh, particularly like the uh, Director Waspy's comments at the board meeting. Like, uh, I, always, I always thought our, our, our campsites were, were too closely packed together and it's, uh, it is, it's, it's nice to see the campgrounds open and uh, have a little more space. Maybe think about that later. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and then uh, in the Anthony Chabot campground, what was, uh, is it, is, was it fully, uh, uh, as it is, was, was it, was it uh, did it fill up over the weekend? Oh, good question. Well, we had reservations for, 37 sites that were available out of because we cut it in half. So, so out of 75 sites at the campground, 37 were made available for reservations and 35 uh, were reserved for our opening weekend. Wow. Good. So there was a lot of interest in coming back, a lot of happy people. Yeah. And were there any, um, any problems at the kiosk with the, uh, having to deal with cash or credit cards or whatever? No, I think the uh, the protocols we put in place are really stressing paying ahead of time, um, paying for all your fees online. Um, and so we've really been able to uh, minimize the amount of transactions between the um, uh, the kiosk staff and the customers. Besides, of course, the uh, the helpful information that they give out, which um, which we're still able to do. And then we have the, the, uh, the plexiglass um, so that they can do that safely. Great. And uh, do you have a sense of uh, the extent of uh, SOD uh, within your unit? That is a, a sobering story. Probably, um, probably uh, facts would be better given by by an expert in, in, in the uh, in the field. But um, uh, one survey that went through and looked at Wildcat Canyon Park estimated. 30% of the Coast Live Oaks were infected with, with sudden oak death. And so at some point would, would perish. Um, and uh, I, I think we're, we're probably looking at similar uh, levels in Tilden Park. And um, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, it's pretty prevalent. Yeah. And now on top of that, the, the Monterey Pines have outlived their, um, their lifespan. So, yeah. Okay. We are, we are seeing some changes, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank. Great report. Uh, and please uh, extend um, the board's uh, uh, appreciation and thank yous for uh, for all the incredible work they've been doing, especially in this period. Uh, it means a lot to, to us and the public. Cool. Yes. Uh, I mean, not director. Uh, AGM <laughs> O'Connor. Um, just a couple of comments. Uh, one is. Uh, 
in Dan's presentation, you know, one of the things we've been concerned about in, in my time here at the district is we were doing the transition really from the generation that included yourself, Director Rosario, Director Waspy, to the new generation. And uh, one of the concerns we had was about this retention of classic park skills like trail work. And uh, certainly Bridget and uh, Colin Gallagher and the rest of the staff at uh, uh, Reinhardt Redwood have really stepped up and really taken this on along with the, the new uh, trail crew uh, run by Patrick Demons. And we're really re reinstituting all those skills that uh, are necessary to running parks. And so I really want a lot of kudos to the staff for really stepping up. I mean, incredible trail work they're doing at Redwood. I've seen a lot of it wow. and it's really high quality. Um, you know, I worked in a lot of parks, uh, including national parks, and I, I think the work that they're doing is of that quality easily. So I'm really impressed with that. The other thing, uh, Director Rosario, in reference to your sudden oak death comments, is we um, have been increasing our spending uh, every year on uh, hazard tree program. And this year we are requesting an increase in the base budget, uh, primarily because we are just dealing with a whole lot of trees. You know, some of it could be aging out, like you're talking about the, the pines, but some of it is most likely related to the sudden oak death and then of course the changing climate. But just thought I'd uh, put that shameless plug in there. So <laughs> that'll come to you in December. Wow. Nice <laughs> and thanks Dan for the presentation. <laughs> Very subtle. <laughs> I'm a big advocate of uh... Uh, making sure we fund the uh, hazardous tree program. Oh, yeah. Chief Castillo. Yeah, so I also wanted to acknowledge basically um, that with the park craft specialists and the other uh, park rangers that are out there, with some of the projects that we do, like um, I know how the director uh, Waspy had mentioned, did we uh, build that fence in house or the gate, the railing over at the Botanic Garden? Uh, things like that we didn't do, but we are definitely improving on the skill set for those who um, want to learn and participate in different arts and uh, constructive things. We're sending them to welding classes and things of that nature to keep that going. So we're not going to lose that either. Yeah, that's good. That's good because that's Dennis and I went through that kind of uh, it was kind of a more more informal program of doing that, just learning from your <laughs> from our welding mm -hmm. guys. But uh, yeah, it's, it's great to see, especially the, the work, uh, what I've seen in Red with the trail work is just unbelievable. Yeah. Very well done. Well, well it's exactly what you guys were saying that it, they take an ownership of their parks at that point. And, you know, they plant a tree one year and five, 10 years pass and 15. And then all of a sudden the tree is big and they remember back on the day when they planted it and what they're making, you know, they can see the accomplishments over time. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, great. Any other comments, questions? Terrific. Well, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, and please, again, thank, thank your crews and your park supervisors and uh, the wonderful work they're doing. I sure will. Thank you. Thank you. And that whole smiling group. <laughs> I hope they're still smiling. And then uh, let's see, we are now at item number six, the review of the 2021 consolidated fee schedule. Tiffany. Hi, Chair Rosario, uh, Tiffany Margolisi, Business Services Manager. So um, the next item is one of our annual items that is a very robust uh, review. <laughs> and um, I, as those of you who have reviewed it before, we typically send out a detailed uh, fee comparison. And um, that was just sent earlier by email. So, uh, and I apologize for that, that it didn't get out uh, sooner. Um, so what I wanted to suggest, uh, Chair Rosario, if it's okay with you, uh, since it, we've been going for a while, the next item is, is going to be, um, you know, in depth, if you would be okay uh, with a, a break, and that during that break, uh, the three board members, uh, if, if we would ask you to please uh, take a look at your email, and if you would like to open up the detailed fee report, um, so that you have that open as Noah goes through his presentation. I think that would uh, facilitate the discussion. Would that be okay? Oh yeah, that'd be totally perfect. Yeah. Okay, so. So uh, how much time do you want? I think five minutes is fine or um, if you, it's up to you. Yeah, five minutes is fine. So uh, we'll see everybody back in five minutes. Okay. Thank you Look so at much. Your emails. Thank you.
है We are back. We're still looking for Director Wee's camp. Uh, we're working to get Director Wee's camp back. Uh, Chair Rosario oh, should be just a couple of minutes. So Director Rosario, you must be, um, what do you think of the trail work at uh, Redwood Park? Oh, it's, it's amazing. They've, so the causeways, really, the oh, causeways yeah. they've built, uh, I can't believe the causeways they've built. They're as quality as any other thing I, I saw at Olympic National Park and the rainforest areas. They're really beautiful. Oh, no, I, I, that's the best trail work I've seen um, in this agency. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, the, uh, the amount of trail work that's been going into it is, is just incredible. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, it's something that I've always wanted to do, but never had the, the time. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. There she is. Director Rosario? Yes. I, I appreciate your comments, but I want you to remember when Gary Crawford was running roads and trails when oh, we that's true. 43, 43 sticks of dynamite in a rock and blew that rock away <laughs> and got the trail in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Different we times. Had we had a dynamiter on the crew. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was a good day. <laughs> well, you know, the, a little of that work. Well, you know, the fishway at the Redwood, that was, uh, that was all in-house mm. Gary and Ralph and Tim yeah okay chair Rosario we've got director Wieskamp back we've got a okay. full committee so uh, whenever you're ready we shall uh re what do they call that we're, we're back we're, we're back on okay so let us continue all right I'll I'll do the lead off into uh this next item this is as uh Tiffany our business services manager mentioned this is our annual process where we look at updating fees and uh, Noah will go into some more details on that. Um, Noah, are you on? I don't see you on. And Tiffany, there's, Noah. there's Noah. So um, what we'll do is um, I'm gonna lead off as you know, uh, Noah, why don't we do your normal introduction to the process? So we review, review that for the audience. And then I'll, I'll lead off with the presentation on administrative fees. Uh, Okie dokie. Um, so uh, just in brief, uh, the Board Operations Committee reviews the proposed fee changes annually in the fall, as we're doing. Uh, fee change proposals may be, I'm sorry, I should introduce myself a little bit more thoroughly. Uh, my name is Noah Dort. I'm an administrative analyst in um, operations business services. And of course, I'm, I'm here today seeking, uh, uh, seeking approval and recommendation of the proposed changes to the consolidated fee schedule uh, with a recommendation, as I mentioned, to the full board for further resolution. Um, again, just to go over it briefly, as I mentioned, we review these fees annually in the fall. Um, fee change proposals may be submitted throughout the year, but the annual process ramps up in late July uh, or early August <clears throat> when we reach out to all park district staff and concession operators to request their proposals for the following year. Um, the Park District also accepts uh, proposals and, um, excuse me, the Park District also accepts and reviews fee change proposals uh, from the public. And um, just one last note here, the consolidated fee schedule is called consolidated because it unifies two uh, separately reviewed and approved fee schedules. Uh, those are the administrative and document fee schedule and the park use fee schedule. Those are unified into one fee schedule for approval by the full board. Um, but I believe as, as Jim may be about to do, um, the operations committee is reviewing uh, proposed changes to the administrative and document fee schedule this year, 
although typically those fees would go through, um, would be reviewed first by the finance committee before being consolidated for the full board. So a little bit of a change this year. Okay, so the um, changes to the administrative fees uh, for this year are, are focused on encroachment permit fees. And I'm gonna do a screen share here. Hopefully everything will work. All right. And everybody sees my screen? Yes. Okay, let me see if I can start this slideshow and see if it works. All right, are you seeing the uh, notes slide or the main notes. slide? Notes, okay, let me switch. Green, it's beautiful. All right. <laughs> All right, let me um, first start off, I wanna say, um, I wanna give some credit here uh, to both uh, Nate Luna, who is our encroachment permits uh, uh, supervisor and uh, his administrative analyst, uh, Meadow Darcy. They've done an incredible amount of work, uh, which is what I am presenting to you today. And I really wanna give them all the credit for the background work here. Uh, it's just an amazing amount of work and high quality work. But let me move on to the present, lay out the, the issue. So um, some of you, especially, uh, I probably remember back, uh, this is way back, I think in 1982, the board adopted a good neighbor policy. And a part of that good neighbor policy was creating the encouragement uh, permit program to allow neighbors who may come onto our property to do uh, weed abatement or who may have uh, gates that enter onto Park District property. And the idea was to uh, capture those entries onto a uh, park district property uh, so that we could ensure that there was um, good protections for the park district. Well, over, over the years, that program has expanded and included uh, commercial activities on park district property. And these permits are really important to making sure that liability issues are covered uh, and that uh, the park district is protected as well as safety issues directly related to um, the interface of some of these projects with the, the public. Uh, so we protect the public by you know, having a process where we address all of these issues. So we have uh, kind of a bifurcation of types of uh, permits here. And this slide that you see here is showing that over the years, the low risk uh, access only permits, these kind of good neighbor permits have actually uh, decreased over time. But what's happened is the complex permits, things especially around those involving like P, uh, PG&E activities on, on purchase properties have increased exponentially, especially in the last few years. Uh, these permits are very complex. They were my, uh, require that Nate and Meadow do a lot of interface with other participant staff, both in the legal department, ASD, especially with stewardship, uh, when we're doing the checkoff list for each of these permits and making sure that we've got all of the park district interests uh, covered. They're very complex, take a lot of time, there's a lot of communications involved with the permittee and with the other staff members. And these permits have really increased in the last few years, especially since uh, PG&E has done their settlement agreement over the, uh, the fi uh, fires, I believe from 2015 and 2017. And so they've really ramped up their request for encroachment permits to do uh, work on Park District property or using Park District property as a staging area for work in the local community. So this has really become problematic because what's happened is that um, over time, this has a, had a significant impact on our encroachment uh, program and our major maintenance program because both Nate and Meadow are now uh, spending a lot of their time managing encroachment permits as opposed to our major maintenance program, which is programs that do internal maintenance uh, type of activities. And this slide here just shows you uh, who's been really um, involved in a lot of these um, uh, complex permits. The ma vast majority of them are PG&E, especially in the last few years. So um, what Nate and Meadow did is they did, we decided it was time to do, uh, to relook at our, our permit fee program. And, and check in with other agencies. You know, we often do benchmarking with other agencies, similar agencies, see what, what are they doing around this area of work and see if we're in a line or if we've uh, fallen behind. So uh, Nate and Meadow did a, a really good deep dive on benchmarking. You can see the agencies that we checked in with here. We have Alameda County, uh, Contra Costa Water District, East Bay Municipal Utility District, uh, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, 
uh, Marin Open Space, uh, Santa Clara Valley Water District. We checked in uh, with their programs because they also manage large areas of open space or public lands. And so we checked in with them and got to see what they were doing. Um, and uh, out of that comparison with other agencies, uh, Nate and Meadow worked with our legal department to come up with a proposal for fee increases that would align us with these other agencies and ensure that we were uh, uh, aligned with the market, so to say. Um, and also that potentially that, you know, the staff time that's involved in managing encroachment permits, uh, it was captured uh, appropriately and that we were getting compensated for the amount of time that we were spending doing this permit work. So this uh, slide in front of you right now uh, shows a comparison to uh, the current fee schedule, which was uh, last, last increase in 2010 uh, and what we're proposing for 2021. I've also got Nate Luna, um, I think Nate is on the is on the uh, Zoom. Are you on there, Nate? Let's see if he pops in here. Hello. Oh, there he is. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us, Nate. And uh, and he can answer any details uh, that uh, certainly better than I can. So if we if we have some uh, questions from the board members, I'll, I will ask him. But essentially, uh, one thing that's really important in the proposed fee schedule is that we are these the simpler permit uh, fee access fees. We're keeping those still minimal. So the good neighbor access uh, fee, the $50 fee is not changing because we do want to uh, uh, encourage neighbors who want to do fuels uh, management work uh, on our property that affects their property. We want to ensure that they're able to do that. And we don't want to restrict that. Um, the real uh, meat of the matter here are the commercial fees such as PG&E. And you can see we've uh, gone from $1,500 we have an application fee. We have a minimum of $875. Uh, plus we're capturing all the inspections that we have to do with these complex permits. That wasn't being captured. We had a simple $1,500 fee, flat fee, but all of the staff time was not being compensated, including inspection fees. Uh, and then also the impacts to park users, You know, taking that into account, how long were they were gonna be there and whether or not it impacted park access for users. So all of those are being, um, included in the proposed changes uh, and aligned with other agencies. I think that uh, another one that's really important here, uh, and more recently we saw this challenge is with um, uh, penalties for a uh, violation of the permit terms or uh, illegal encroachments on the park district property. You might recall, I believe it was last year, 2019, where PG&E had set up a staging area in Sibley and um, without due notice uh, or expanded beyond what they had uh, talked with the park supervisor about uh, and had made a significant encroachment into the parklands. Uh, they ended up paying about, I think it was around something $69,000 in fees. Uh, and it didn't seem to, to, they didn't seem to bat an eye around that, uh, which was kind of interesting to us, but we've in increased these penalties for illegal encroachments or violations of the permit terms significantly to uh, discourage that type of activity. So I think, um, why don't I give Nate a chance, if you, Nate, if you wanna highlight any of these changes, why don't I give you a moment to, to, uh, to jump in here. Sure. Hello, um, members of the board, this is Nate Luna. I am a project manager in maintenance. I also oversee the encroachment permit program. And um, what we have found um, in the fees as they stand today, um, they haven't been updated since 2010. And we were pretty locked in to uh, kind of, what is our maximum fee of $1,500? Uh, and that is whether the permit is 30 days or a year, um, the, the fee would be $1,500. So we weren't actually capturing any of the, the time, the coordination or the inspections out in the field uh, that have to take place. And oftentimes there are issues with encroachment permits. Uh, so we also did not have any sort of penalties that we could apply. Um, so we worked a lot with the legal department, um, Philip Coffin in the land department and Meadow Darcy and um, we came up with some calculators for what our minimum, the minimum amount of time it takes park staff um, 
and operations, stewardship, and legal to work on these encroachment permits. And that is what is shown here. That is what we applied to our proposed fee is the minimum amount of time it takes us to um, intake permits, to send them for review, to draft them, and to issue them. Um, and so we're trying to capture the time that it takes our, our staff uh, to, do, to do the work, which we weren't prior. And by adding the weekly inspection fees, we capture the length of the permit and the length of the entity, the permittee on site. And that more accurately reflects the cost to the park district. One other fee that we've added is the helicopter landing zone fee. Um, PG&E uh, has been using park district lands. We've been applying for and receiving encroachment permits for helicopter landing zones. And oftentimes these tie up large areas of, of um, park district land. And uh, one thing that we always try, it's, it's a kind of a coordination issue with these. Um, so they, have, they cannot fly over uh, roads with the equipment that they need to get to the towers. So they use our properties to fly over parkland, but they'll be flying over our park users, which means trails, people walking dogs, people on bikes, that type of thing. So we have to coordinate with them in order to have them close trails when they do the overhead flying work. Hmm. And it's a, it's a lot more coordination than just a normal on the ground encroachment permit. So that's one added uh, item on our proposed fees. Great. Um, with that, why don't I stop here with this slide here. These are the proposed fees uh, for 2021. And uh, we're here to take any questions the committee members may have. Sounds logical. Director Waspy. Um, am I muted? Nope. nope. <laughs> you are now. Oh, you're muted now. Thank you. So I, I guess my question would be, I, I support the, the, the um, uh, moving these fees up in some cases. I'm, I'm interested in the, um, the little guy or the good, good neighbor. So as a good neighbor, which I would consider myself, if I wanted to get an a encroachment permit, a gate, good neighbor access permit for seven days, I assume the fee's 50 bucks, or yeah, $50. Would I then acquire, and then what I would, would like to do is say, let's say I want to plant a big giant rock in my backyard and I'll need a backhoe to dig a hole and bring a rock to my backyard. Do, is it $50 or do I need an administrative review and a professional review and an inspection fee? Or does that, do those accumulate or is it 50 bucks? So for good neighbors, we're keeping the fee at $50 Total. Okay. And that is for work under seven days where you're taking equipment from a gate or from an access through the park onto private property. Perfect. Great. Doing the work on private property. And that we waive that fee if that work is fuel reduction for fires. Excellent. Right. And, and Nate, if I can follow up, it's a little off key, but so how many people have taken advantage of that? Um, the fuel reduction work or do you, do you have any statistics and seeing who's who's doing that work who is anybody participating yes uh, yes the clear they sure are we had about five this year we have between five and ten every year oh, five gee. and ten folks and how many how many uh fence line neighbors do we have uh, <laughs> hundreds thousands and hundreds. Thousands. Quite a yeah, so yeah, the number I heard was 77,000. That's what Carol says all the time. So good Lord. Well, okay. Yep, we have, uh, so this year so far, we've done 95 encroachment permits. So you can see the good neighbor versus the Chevrons, the, you know, Philip 66, the PG&E. The good neighbors are a very small amount of our work. The larger corporations that are approaching us with their lawyers are a large, large part of, of our work. So mm -hmm. we're, we're being careful to, you know, run, uh, 
our encroachment permits, you know, through our team here at the park district um, and, and being very careful to protect uh, potential liability and collect the correct proper insurance and, um, and um, have the you know, park district indemnified. Excellent, thanks very much. I support this fully. Great. And again, these are uh, the minimum fees. Um, they don't all have to be applied, but it gives us a little bit more room to work with, with the larger encroachments. Director Wieskamp, do you have any other questions? No, it, it makes sense. I had not thought about the helicopter landing zones at all, but I can see where that would be happening. And you'd certainly need to know about it and where they are. Yeah. So the helicopter yeah. landing zones also coordinate with our public safety. Um, they coordinate with our helicopter team. Um, right. they, we have to let them know when they're up in the air so that we don't have conflicts there. So there is a lot more involved and we just, you know, we're giving it away for $1,500 uh, you know, every time. <laughs> I, 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 you've convinced me that that oh, is something we need to pay attention to. So fine. It looks all Thank looks you. reasonable. Director Waspy. And yeah, Nate, under item um, 11. So you're raising the fee for, for unauthorized access from 300 to 1500. Is that driven by the fact that people are just driving into the parks and breaking through their fences or putting in and, and are, are there lots of violations is my question. I can tell you exactly what, what's driving that. Um, uh, certain public utility, uh, I think they feel it's, it's less to pay our penalty than it is to go through our encroachment permits. And they have, uh, we found them on our land with helicopters and they're refueling trucks without encroachment permits. And they okay. say, okay, well, we've been there for three days, we'll pay your fee. So oh. um, so we've, we've raised that. We really want to discourage people from unauthorized access. And we also want to discourage them from violating permit conditions because right now we don't have any sort of, not enforcement, but we don't have any way of, you know, backing up our, our conditions. And that's what we're trying to do here. All right. Richard, is are you okay with me? Uh, stop screen sharing so we can see each other. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll stop screen sharing. There we are. Uh, you know, Director Rosario, um, one more thing I'd like to add in that's really important, um, especially since we have members of the public listening to this conversation. You know, this encroachment permit uh, are not about revenue generation for the park district. This is really about liability and protecting uh, park visitors. Just a classic example in the time that I've been with the park district, we had a, a public agency where we had a um, trail over their property um, they were very resistant because the prop, they were the property underlying property owners about getting an encroachment permit. Um, we kept going back and forth with them. Um, they decided to have their contractors, they were doing some work that involved closing off a section of, the, of this trail. And um, we kept telling them, we want to interface with you and make sure that we give good notice to the public, have good signage on site. Uh, unfortunately, there was a person who came along at night on the trail and ran into the uh, construction fencing that they had set up. Um, and uh, they were very much convinced after that, that um, our process was valuable. And I just want to make sure that we uh, get that out on the record that, you know, this, this process is not about money making. It's about protecting visitors mm -hmm. and about protecting the interests of the park district. So that's, that's really what the process is about. And these fees that we're talking about are really just recovering our cost, this is not a money-making venture at all. It's just really recovering the actual cost that the park district has in related to managing, implementing and managing these permits. Great. Thank you for that for clarification. Very important, yes. Uh, I have no questions. I think it's totally makes sense. Um, and uh, I think uh, if there's, uh, no further questions or discussion? Operations. Hopefully, give me an hour. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, we're going to. Yeah, so I just wanted to, um, now that we've covered the administrative fee portion, we will pass the baton to administrative analyst Noah Dort, who will carry on with the uh, concessionaire fee and park use fee section. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, everybody. 
Um, all right, um, before I start screen sharing, uh, let me just um, also note that as Tiffany said, uh, this is a, a, robust, a robust subject here um, to look at these fees. So I'm sorry, you only uh, just recently had a chance to look at the details document, um, which shows the comparisons and a, and a more detailed breakdown of the fee changes, uh, the proposed fee changes. So um, I'll go ahead and start screen sharing one moment here. All right, hopefully you're able to see the screen there. Are you seeing our, my presentation? Yes, mm -hmm. Wonderful, okay. Um, uh, as I mentioned, um, I'm here seeking approval, uh, excuse me, seeking recommendation of the proposed changes to the consolidated fee schedule um, with a recommendation, as I said, to the full board. Um, I already mentioned some very brief highlights here, but I did wanna add uh, some additional items here just to note um, that the consolidated fee schedule also includes information on the Regional Parks Foundation membership program, uh, though those fees are set by the foundation's board and only require park district board approval when there are changes to the benefits or structure that would impact park district procedures or other revenue. Um, and there are, the foundation did not provide any such changes for 2021, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, concessionaires and park district staff make recommendations for changes based on a variety of factors, including demand, operating costs, and price comparisons of similar services or facilities operated by other agencies and businesses in the area. Research to ensure comparable and competitive fee ranges was vetted and reviewed by staff. Concession agreements require the prior written consent of the park district before increasing fees or instituting any additional services or charges. The agreements further state that consent shall not be unreasonably withheld and that the park district agrees to approve any price changes that are below immediate competitor prices. That consent is provided or not through board approval, starting with a review by this committee, followed by recommendation to the full board for final approval. Um, for the operations committee review this year, there are 10 fee proposals from concession operators, four park use fee proposals from park district staff, and you already heard administrative and document fee proposals from AGM O'Connor uh, and Nate Luna. I will briefly go over the three documents that you should now have available um, to you. And the first document is the staff report for this agenda item. This is a simple bare bones list of proposed changes to the current fee schedule, showing only the price change or removal or addition for each fee. In some cases, further information is needed to provide proper context or to better understand the intent or desired result of proposed changes. And I wanna highlight that all other fees not listed here would remain unchanged. Unless otherwise noted, all approved fee change proposals will go into effect on January 1st of next year. There are no fees with proposed delayed implementation for 2021, though it should be noted that there are proposed changes for 2022 where reservations may be made several months in advance. Those changes would also go into effect on January 1st of 2021, but apply to reservations taking place in 2022. The second document <clears throat> uh, provides more details on each fee change proposal. As I mentioned, you should have that. We're looking at CPI at the moment. And what I will do um, to hopefully bring your attention to that details document is just mention which page, uh, which page I'm referencing when I get to that slide. So the CPI information is on page two of that details document. Um, uh, CPI or the consumer price index measures the average change over time of a market basket of goods and services and is widely used as a measure of inflation. Average CPI typically hovers around 3% per year over the long run, but more rapid economic expansion or contraction can move that average more significantly. Um, you should be able to see at the bottom of that details page, uh, or well, on page two in more detail, but at the bottom of each page, I've also listed the CPI um, for the previous five years. That uh, would be 2020, excuse me, 2019 um, through 2014, and the previous 10 years, 2019 through uh, 2010. Mm -hmm. As you can see, they do hover around that 3%, although we've had some changes over that time as well. The local CPI for 2020 year to date is currently at an average of 1.8% due to the economic impact of restrictions put in place to limit the spread of COVID-19. The CPI information along with the annual growth rate 
is intended to provide additional context for fee proposals. That is, how fee proposals compare with inflation, especially when fee changes are infrequent. All right, next up on the um, details, page one, the details document includes a guide to reading that document. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't repeat that information, but please let me know if you have any questions and please stop me at any time if you have any questions. Um, instead, I will briefly mention the relevant sections and how they will be presented today. Each fee proposal includes a blue topped table of the current fee, proposed fee, the percent change between the two, and a few previous changes. The slides you see today will only include the most recent previous change. The orange topped shape, excuse me, the orange topped table shows comparisons with similar providers in the area. Wherever possible, these are apples to apples comparisons. However, it is often necessary to expand the parameters of distance, public or private operation, et cetera, of comparison providers due to several factors, um, primarily a limited number of similar local providers or a wide variety in fee structure or the included and optional elements of a specific service, fee, or location. Um, just real briefly, you can read that those comparison tables, they're intended to be uh, read left from left to right for each fee. Um, an example from, uh, from the first, first comparison here, um, <clears throat> uh, item number one, that's for the Anthony Chabot Equestrian Center, and uh, that should be on page three. Um, that second comparison there, you can read it as Graceland Equestrian in Castro Valley with a current 2020 fee of $810 to $910 per month for boarding is 42.1% to 50.4% more expensive than the proposed boarding fees at Anthony Chabot Equestrian Center for 2021. And again, I wanna stress here uh, one more time that these comparisons are 2020, current 2020 comparisons against the proposed 2021 fees. Um, and I also should also note that that orange topped table is actually ordered uh, from top to bottom. The uh, top line will have the um, comparison providers that are more expensive. And at the bottom, uh, going down at the bottom of that table will be comparison providers that are less expensive or less more expensive <laughs> in some cases uh, than, um, than, the, than the park district uh, facility or uh, provider. All right. Um, you will not. You will not see. You will not see these orange top tables in today's slides. But I will mention a fee proposal's place in the broader context of its comparison providers. Um, the green top table is the previously mentioned annual growth rate. Uh, I mentioned that under CPI. The green top table is the previously mentioned annual growth rate for the proposed fees, and will appear in today's slides. The annual growth rate smooths infrequent fee changes to show how they would look if changes were instead made each year. The starting year for each proposed fee's annual growth rate was selected to be the most recent fee change within approximately five or 10 years to more easily compare to the five and 10 year CPI averages that were provided and again that you can see at the bottom in the footer of each page. The third document is the current consolidated fee schedule for your reference. Uh, and again, if you look at the details document, each, um, each underlying heading will, will have a reference to the consolidated fee schedule uh, where it appears, which page, a CFS page, whatever that might be. Uh, I will start with the 10 fee proposals for concessions and then move on to the park use fee proposals. In the interest of time, a few similar fee proposals have been grouped together. I will briefly mention the basics of each fee proposal, but please stop me at any time if you have questions or want to discuss any fee proposal in more detail. I'd also like to add that there are a few concessionaire guests this afternoon, and they should be available to answer questions on their, on their proposals. From Base Camp Hospitality, operators of the Lake Chabot Marina, we have Director of Social Media, Holly Potts, and I believe we may still have, I think she might have dropped off, but uh, Vice President of Operations for the Central Region, Donna Duran. From American Golf, operators of the Tilden Park Golf Course, we have General Manager of the Tilden Park Golf Course, Tucker Williams. All right, um, first up, these can be found on details of the details uh, section, excuse me, the details document pages three and 10. Again, these are grouped together for for convenience. Um, first up are the Anthony Chabot Equestrian Center and Las Trampas Stables. Uh, 
These two concessions are operated by one concessionaire who is proposing a $25 per month increase to all boarding fees for both locations. The proposed increases are reasonable, especially when, within the context of comparison providers. And you can also see that the annual growth rate for those um, is well below uh, the standard inflation rate and the inflation rate that we have um, specifically here. Assuming approval of the fee proposal, these two locations would be among the low cost range of options available for boarding, similar to the other local publicly owned and privately operated Oakland City stables. The park district's other stables are usually the only, other, uh, the only others in this low cost group. Moving on, um, you'll see this on the details uh, pages four and 11. This is Skyline Ranch in Anthony Chabot and Piedmont Stables in Reinhardt Redwood. These two concessions are also operated by one concessionaire, a different concessionaire. And that concessionaire is proposing a $40 per month increase to all boarding fees for both locations and a $10 per lesson or per person increase to all types of lessons. I should note that there's only one large stall at Piedmont Stables and that is reserved for quarantine or medical use. Uh, I am told, um, at least as of a, a month ago or so, uh, that fortunately they have not had to, to use that yet. <clears throat> the proposed increases are reasonable, especially within the context of comparison providers. And again, um, with, uh, with context of inflation. Assuming approval of the fee proposal, these two locations would also be among the low cost range of options available for boarding. Again, similar to the other locally publicly owned and privately operated Oakland City Stables. Moving on, this will be on details page seven, excuse me, page five. We have uh, Palmdale Estates events at Ardenwood. The concessionaire is proposing both an increase to venue rental fees, as well as an adjustment to the reserved venue rental duration, which would decrease the earlier ceremony only duration by one hour and increase the later ceremony and reception duration by one hour. The first number on the change column shows the flat difference between the current and proposed fee, while the second number after the slash shows the per hour difference when including duration adjustments if you wanted to look at it that way. Um, now is a good time to, uh, to note that the proposed decreases, uh, any proposed decreases that you see will appear in red font. And you can see that in the ceremony only duration change and the Saturdays and holidays venue per hour difference. The concessionaire also proposes increases to the hourly rate for corporate events and the starting rate for catering food and for drinks that include adult beverages. Um, Non-adult beverages or rather the uh, under 21 drinks will remain the same. Oops. Did not mean to hit that. Although there are some significant increases over the last few years, the proposed fees are still reasonable within the context of comparison providers. Most comparison providers have a lower venue rental fee, but higher catering or other service fees. So it's important to look at this as a package um, when looking at those comparisons. That comparison table actually has um, Palmdale estate events at the top, just for easier reference. I set a sort of standard comparison for you to look at. Assuming approval, approval of the fee proposal, Palmdale Estate events would be among the low cost range of options for mixed indoor outdoor wedding packages, um, which they do not do, uh, they only do outdoor. Uh, they would be in the mid range of outdoor only wedding packages, though there are um, limited options for that. Next up, details page six, we have United Camps Conferences and Retreats or UCCR who will be going into their second full year operating Camp Arroyo. Last year, UCCR continued, continued with the already approved outdoor environmental education rates that were proposed by the previous operator. UCCR will again continue those rates in 2021, but is proposing an increase for 2022. Similarly, in 2020, UCCR continued with the already approved overnight conference rates proposed by the previous operator. However, UCCR is proposing an increase in these rates for both 2021 and 2022. The proposed rates are reasonable, especially in the context of both inflation, um, but also among comparison providers. <clears throat> among, excuse me, assuming approval of the fee proposal, UCCR would be among the low cost range of options available for overnight outdoor environmental education. 
and among the mid-range of options available for camp style overnight conference rentals. Moving on, this will be on details page seven. We have the Board Sports California at Crown Beach. This concessionaire proposes an increase to their popular kids two-day wind surf camp. That's wind, W-I-N-D as in Don Castro, wind surf camp, as well as proposing a new service of lessons <clears throat> for wing surfing, that's W-I-N-G, G as in Garen, wing surfing. Wing surfing uses an inflatable handheld sail combined with a windsurf board or a stand-up foil board. I believe there's a typo in the details there, but a stand-up foil board, which allows the rider to hydrofoil up out of the water and achieve faster speeds. You can actually see that in the image below, they're hydrofoiling up out of the water. And again, that allows them to travel even faster than they normally would. The proposed fee for these lessons is close to the current fee uh, that the concessionaire charges for kiting lessons. <clears throat> and the proposed fees overall seem reasonable, uh, though it should definitely be noted that there are very few comparison providers available for either service. Assuming approval of the fee proposal, board sports would be similar to, or it could possibly be said in the mid-range of, options available for kids windsurf camps and wing surfing lessons. Uh, next up, details pages eight and nine, we have the Lake Chabot Marina and Cafe operated by Base Camp Hospitality. The concessionaire is proposing increases to all blocks of time for all types of boat rental fees, as well as an increase to the hourly rate for lake tours for all ages. The concessionaire notes that there is a high demand for boat rentals at Lake Chabot and that there is a 50% discount for seniors, that's ages 62 and above, on weekdays and a 50% discount to military any day of the week. The concessionaire states that the fee proposal is due to increased operating costs overall, but especially due to thorough sanitizing of each boat after use to prevent the spread of COVID-19. These cleaning procedures effectively reduce the number of boats available throughout the day as it takes longer to make them ready for the next boater. Here are additional fees. Similarly, the increases for lake tours are proposed to offset tour boat capacity reductions for preventing the spread of COVID-19. To keep up with the increased operating costs while still meeting high demand, <clears throat> the concessionaire is proposing larger increases for the full day rentals. Those are over four hours relative to shorter rentals. I'll go back so you can see that as well here. This may encourage more short rentals, thus making more boats avail available to accommodate as many boaters as possible. Comparisons with other providers are complicated by a limited number of larger boat rental providers, specifically larger electric boats, while other providers may, have only, may only have smaller vessels available, but have more of those vessels available. In other words, a volume, <clears throat> excuse me, in other words, a volume uh, con consideration there. There's also a wide variety in the rate structures from other providers. For example, some providers have daily maximums and one provider charges different rates by boater residency. The proposed fees are reasonable, if a little on the high end, depending on the length of the rental. Broadly speaking, boat rentals from other providers are less expensive in the first few hours, but those that have consistent hourly rates with no maximum quickly become more expensive than longer rentals from the Lake Chabot Marina. And of course, uh, boating around Lake Merritt in Oakland is a very different experience than boating around Lake Chabot. Assuming approval of the fee proposal, Lake Chabot Marina would be among the mid to high cost range of options available for boat rentals. I suppose I can take a pause here if you guys wanna have any questions or have any questions on this, um, as I believe we do have uh, the concessionaire available. Any questions from the directors? Director Waski. Well, you know, I, I, I kind of, I'll understand uh, raising the rates on boats and stuff, but I, I surely question or would like a little bit more explanation on how you, how you can take your lake tour, and I assume that's the Chabot Queen, and go from $6 an hour to $10 an hour, which is 66.7% increase, and it's a 4.3 increase over the last time it was increased, and then a 14.8 over 2017. I just think that, you know, the opportunity for people that we always talk about who we want to serve, and this is close to underserved communities, lots of people come to that lake, and it's the first time they've ever seen a lake. 
I don't expect them to say, I want to go rent a kayak or an electric motorboat or anything. But I, I think this is a real opportunity to get people out on that beautiful boat to see what's going on and, and see all the natural, beautiful things you have right there in the San Leandro Castro Valley. Also, I think that, um, and you know, raising the kids rate 71%, I, 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 I don't get that. I mean, I, I understand everybody's needs to make some money, but let's face it, and I love the Lake Chabot Marina Cafe staff. I see them quite often. I eat there quite often. I enjoy the product. I launch my kayak there. But in this case, in that lake tour deal, I, I can't help but think that it's a big boat, costs a lot of money. I know that I, I, the tour guide is great, but you're pointing out our natural resource. When you take the tour out, you go behind Bass Cove, you see, hey, look how this park district managed their parks. Look how we created a fishery here. Look how we fostered our stewardship department where we've got bald eagles nesting right there but that's the big attraction and we've provided that uh i, I just wish we could have been a little less uh, well i don't know what the word i want to use I, I wish it hadn't gone up so much for the lake too yeah um i could certainly uh, make a comment but it might be better to um to have uh uh base camp hospitality uh, comment directly I don't know if we have them here. Can you all hear me? I'm, I just unmuted myself. So this is Holly with Base Camp Hospitality. Thank you for giving me your uh, time today. Um, you know, with regard to the lake tour, you know, we try and get as many people on that tour as possible. Unfortunately, now with COVID, um, we've got uh, social distancing oh. limits. Sorry, did someone say something? No. Okay, so we have social distancing limits. Um, so we're just we're trying to get more people um, on the lake, um, and it's going to be a higher turnover. Um, and I apologize that Donna is not here. Um, the vice president um, was was on the call, but had to take another call in the interim. Um, so basically, it's it's because of the COVID in general that we're able, we're only able to take about fifty percent of the capacity in general. Um, and so this could just be a temporary increase just to cover the cost of COVID and the sanitation in between the guests and for the limited number of passengers that were able to um, accommodate on the actual boat tour. Um, and then it also accommodates the tour driver. Hmm. Director Wieskamp? I think it's logical. It's a business decision, but I'd like it to be written somewhere that it is temporary while the covert situation is going on. That would be my suggestion. I think a lot of small businesses, and essentially these are small businesses, are having a lot of problems. And uh, I, th I think I see the necessity, but I think it should be notified that it is temporary if we do while the covert situation is what it is. That's just AJ my comment. Just um, toward, towards that end, Director Wieskamp, uh, Noah keeps pretty extensive notes on his process. Okay. And as we've said, we review these sheets annually. And I think what we could do is approach base camp uh, next year in the process and see where things are at uh, in terms of the pandemic and uh, getting back to normal, whatever that's gonna look like here in a year. Right. Okay. Yeah, and then my comment is to, um, overall, uh, our small businesses uh, are in concessionaires are caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, their costs are going up, but at the same time, uh, you know, CPI has only gone up 1.8%. So the general public is, uh, not going to see that kind of a, a, a change in their in their earnings, and so um, yeah, it's a tough decision. Uh, maybe uh, is there a possibility with with a lot of the, these agreements that, um, like Director Wieskamp proposed, uh, if um, if we see a drop 
in visitorship or usage with, with these concessions? Uh, is there an ability for them to come back and reduce their rates? Yes, um, absolutely. Please go ahead, Holly. I, I was just, yes, absolutely. In, in fact, you know, this is a proposal. Um, we certainly, you know, are, we want to work with you um, and we want your approval on your buy-in. So, you know, maybe if we, we'd be willing to split the difference. Um, if that's an opportunity or an option, maybe it's only a $10 an hour um, rate. And then, you know, a year from now, like I'm not sure who was speaking earlier, but said maybe we can evaluate, you know, where we are in COVID and what the new normal is going to look like. Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe our numbers are, it, I know that I'm not in, I'm not alone in knowing that we have no idea what the future holds. And so um, we're just basically trying to plan for today. And, um, but again, we, we want to be fair and we want to be cooperative. So having yeah. said that, certainly willing you to. Have, you also yeah. have a right to a living too. So uh, <laughs> I think that, that's the American way. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know if uh, my colleagues agree on the board, uh, if, if we can uh, put in these agreements that if visitorship does decrease because of the cost increase, that there's an ability to uh, reduce the rates, uh, then um, I, 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 would, I would approve these, these rates as, as, they, as they go forward. What do you guys if think? I could, if I could add a, a comment in, in relation to that, um, uh, certainly um, we have some processes for fee changes. Um, although uh, we, we don't encourage it, um, we do have an option for mid-year fee changes, mm -hmm. uh, proposals that come in mid-year. Um, and in addition, I should, I should note that uh, certainly um, most, if not all of our concession operators are very aware of, um, of the, the, uh, the demand um, yeah. And uh, the prevalence of customers are not, and so it, it is. Um, it has happened that concessionaires will uh, back down uh, some fees, back off on some fees um, to increase uh, demand. You know where they see that that's that lagging, uh, and, and also uh, sort of a quirk of this um, uh, process or our agreements is that. Um, Fee decreases technically do not require board approval. Um, fee increases do, um, but we certainly do uh, need to be made aware of those decreases because um, we we have a variety of uh, things that follow on from uh, from fees, um, including projected uh, revenue and that sort of thing. Our, our audit manager takes a look at all that stuff, so um, that option is there. And then I just wanted to add one more thing, um, uh, Director Rosario. Is um, you did reference the the year to date 2020 CPI, which is at 1.8 but I do want to be clear that that CPI is not measuring wages. That CPI is, is actually for, uh, for spending. The CPI for wages is actually a different measurement. And although ideally it roughly tracks uh, with the other, it, it does not always. And I don't actually have the, what that's called the CPIW. I do not actually have that information right. at the moment. I think that comes out in April or does it come out in February? <laughs> February. Um, so yeah. Um, what's, uh, what's, do we, we still have more, more presentations is that correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. If, if you guys are okay. all, <laughs> I can yeah, well, let's, on. like, let's keep that in, keep, keep that in mind and we'll, let's continue. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on. This is next one is on details, page 12. Uh, we have at Tilden, the Redwood Valley Railway, also known as the steam train. The concessionaire proposes an increase to the fees for a single ticket and a five ticket card. The proposed fees are reasonable, especially considering these fees haven't changed since 2012 and are well below the customary inflation rate. And during that time, um, assuming approval of the fee proposal, Redwood Valley Railway would be among the low range cost of options available for miniature train rides. Next up, details pages 13 and 14, we have the Tilden Park Golf Course operated by American Golf. The concessionaire is proposing increases to regular and twilight greens fees throughout the week and on holidays. Super twilight greens fees would also increase, <clears throat> but a flat fee would be separated into different rates for Fridays and for weekends and holidays. Similarly, early bird back nine green fees would change to different rates for Monday through Thursday and for Fridays, but these new rates would be a decrease from the flat fee, uh, which would remain the same for weekends and holidays. So again, here you can see um, uh, an example of a concessionaire decreasing fees to encourage more use. 
Um, the proposal also includes, um, well, you can see it here again, but the proposal also includes an increase to cart fees for nine hole, twilight, super twilight, juniors and seniors. The concessionaire proposes an increase to senior green fees Monday through Thursday. The proposal also includes the removal of senior greens fees for weekends and holidays and an increase of the senior threshold from age 55 and over to age 60 and over. Both of these changes, that is the removal of weekends and holidays senior greens fees rates and the increase from uh, 55 and up to 60 and up, both of these changes would match what appears to be the market standard. All comparison providers had a senior threshold of 60 and over with no discount for weekends and holidays, excuse me, no senior discount for weekends and holidays. The concessionaire also proposes to increase the monthly senior ticket price. Monthly senior tickets cover, excuse me, monthly senior tickets cover greens fees Monday through Friday, cart fees are extra, and are only available to Tilden Park Seniors Golf Club members who currently pay $25 per year for membership and are eligible at age 55 and over. Um, as I understand it, the concessionaire would also charge Tilden Park Seniors Golf Club members at the individual senior greens fees rates, even though they may be in the younger senior or junior senior age range of 55 to 59. Uh, the proposed fees are reasonable considering comparison providers, as well as the length of time since changes prior to fees approved for this year. So you can see that the, some previous fees changed uh, just this year, but before that, it's been quite a while. Um, and changes uh, to match market standard are also reasonable. Comparisons are complicated by the wide variety of golf course quality and experience, as well as most comparison providers charging different rates based on golfer residency. Assuming the fee change approval, the Tilden Park golf course would be among the mid to high range of cost of options available for golfing on publicly owned courses. And again, here I will pause because we have, I believe we have Tucker Williams, the general manager of the Tilden Park Golf Course here to help answer any questions. Here, Rosario, we also have um, some public uh, commenters that would like to speak. Yes, thank you, Jim. Uh, I think we'll hear, let's see. I guess we should, we should hear the public comments first. Chair Rosario, this is a uh, management uh, analyst, Ruby Tumber. We have three speakers from the Senior Club of Tilden. We have Tucker Williams, as well as Carolyn. And Carolyn, if you could say your last name when you speak, as well as Mr. Jim Dietrich. Um, we can start with Jim first. If you want to unmute and turn your camera on, please. And we'll follow up with Carolyn. I understand Tucker is having some issues with connectivity. Oh, hi. Um... It says that I'm unable to start my video because the host has stopped it. This is this is Jim. We okay, can... let's see. There you are. There you are. You're there. <clears throat> you are with us. You can see me? Yes. Oh, okay. Somebody. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, uh, by the way, I live a 10 minute walk from the entrance at Wildcat to uh, Tilden Park and I, fully appreciate all your efforts and I thoroughly enjoy using the park and have for years and years. So um, what I want to uh, address, and thank you for letting me address your board. Uh, my name is Jim Diedrich. And if you don't mind, I'll be reading from a prepared statement and um, feel free to stop me at any time if you have any questions. Um, I'm the home tournament director of uh, of the Tilden Seniors Golf Club and the editor of its online bulletin board. Uh, because of the short one day notice of this meeting and the proposed increase in the senior monthly card, our club president, uh, Gil Lee, it wasn't able to attend today. So I'm, I'm one, of the, uh, one person from the board, along with, I believe, Bob Scott is the other, who's our uh, handicap uh, board member. Um, we, we've submitted to your uh, communications, uh, our communications yesterday with Tiffany pointed out effects of the monthly card price increase on our, on our seniors who are often on fixed incomes that do not enjoy CPI level increases 
and for whom golf may be their main form of exercise and social interaction, particularly now during the pandemic. We realize from your perspective that the increase in terms of the CPI looks quite reasonable, but the evidence shows that your belief that you are serving the needs of our club seniors is unfortunately misplaced. In 2016, with a $25 increase from $125 to $150 in the senior monthly card, we lost over 100 members from our club within months when the club membership renewals were due. That was close to half our membership. Those are 100 seniors you thought you were serving, but no longer are. Adding to our sense of how little seniors mattered, we were shut out of the process and kept in the dark entirely leading up to the change in 2016. With this proposed $20 increase from $150 to $170, we anticipate you will serve even fewer seniors. By any conservative estimate, these two increases will have reduced seniors who benefit from the monthly card by about 75% from the pre-2016 levels. Let me try and put a little bit of flesh on, on these bones and look at some numbers. I mean, the CPI, and I know Noah is a great data wonk, but there are some real, real things going on here that I think need to be taken into, into account. Uh, I'm not unusual in that I try to play golf twice a week or eight times a month. Namely, uh, one away tournament that our club sponsors and seven rounds at Tilden. But seniors and their spouses have unexpected health, in health issues, injuries like back problems, they unexpectedly have to help with their grandkids. Poor weather factors. Dr. Dietrich? Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, you do have a three minute uh, time allotment and your time is up. Let me give him a little extension. Why don't you, why don't you let him uh, um, I don't have, have, I don't have that much more. He's speaking more than halfway through. through. Per the committee, we can continue. Okay, thank you. Um, so unexpected health issues, injuries like back problems, they unexpectedly have to help with their grandkids, poor weather, unhealthy air, park closures, and the like, and easily limit the number of rounds to six or fewer per month at Tilden. We know from postings that most seniors average probably less than six rounds per month because of all of these things. Even at six rounds per month, at the new proposed public senior rack rate of $28, that's $168 for six rounds. So seniors will have to think twice before ponying up $170 for the monthly card unless they can easily and consistently average more than six rounds per month. It has been obvious since 2016 that American Golf wants to nudge everyone into their players club. Why? Because that will provide them with $36 per player per month or $432 per year. And that doesn't even cover a single round of golf. That's 40% of the $1,080 Franklin Canyon charges per year or $90 per month for seniors for all of their week, weekday golf. That contrasts dramatically with a $2,040 per year the monthly card will cost, or even if you only buy it nine months, it'll still be $1,530. So my main question in concluding is, are you serving seniors or just aiding American golf and forcing seniors into more expensive programs or possibly reducing their golfing to balance out their costs? The increased revenue you anticipate may be lower than expected if this increase leads to fewer senior rounds, limiting <clears throat> spending for food, golf supplies when the course fully opens. We propose at a minimum that a decision be deferred 
until we can obtain data from you or American Golf and have a chance to survey our members on this issue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Deere. Next? Our next speaker is uh, Carolyn. It says, Carolyn's iPad, if you could please introduce yourself by first and last name. And please note you have a three minute time limit. Yes, hello, this is Bob Scott calling. I'm the handicap chairman of Tilden Seniors. Uh, I've been a member up there for about 20 years. And uh, the last time the rate went up to 150, as Jim pointed out, we lost many members. It's just something that guys just don't have in their budget. Uh, a lot of our guys are in their 80s, and it's a tough – now that – plus they want to raise the carts to $11, and a lot of guys just can't walk that course. A lot of us do walk it in our late 70s, but uh, it's a tough walk, as you know, 5.3 miles up and down the hills. But it's a great source of community uh, involvement, keeps us attached to the park. Uh, it's it's going to – once – that $170 figure comes out. By the way, we didn't even know this until yesterday. We were kind of blindsided by this rate increase, caught us off guard. We haven't had a chance to bring it to the uh, Tilden Golf Club for their consideration. So we're really opposed to this, this raise to 170. Uh, plus the fact during the week, we only get to play Monday through Friday. We don't get to go on the weekends where there are higher rates for the general public, but what you find quite often during the week is that the seniors will uh, patronize the food and beverage considerably because a lot of seniors don't want to cook. They'll just stick around the patio and eat food and drink beer, and it helps the revenue of the, of the golf course. Plus, we pay for balls as well on the driving range, which is another big source of revenue that uh, if you drive the seniors away during the week, you would lose considerable revenue when we get the patio going again. So. I defer to Jim as a, most of his uh, economic analysis, and we hope that we could keep, at least for another year, the, and while we're in this pandemic, not pay a, an increase in the senior monthly card. Uh, does that make sense to, to the board? Yes, yes. Do we have another speaker? We do. We have one more speaker, uh, Mr. Tucker Williams, but it looks like he's having trouble connecting. I'm not sure if he can hear us, but Mr. Williams, you may submit your comment uh, to our email address. Um, Ruby, is is this the uh, general manager of the golf course, Tucker Williams? That's correct. So, correct. Mr. Williams, this is your opportunity to uh, speak up uh, regarding the fee, proposed fee changes. I think you might have uh, be having technical difficulties. So in, in, if you don't mind, I'll just make a quick uh, comment on a data point um, raised by Mr. Jim Dietrich. Um, uh, I did take a look at the players club um, that he mentioned that is uh, through American golf um, and ran a few numbers. Uh, and actually what he says sounds uh, definitely correct in terms of um, where these thresholds are. At the current $150 uh, monthly senior ticket, um, if you include uh, the cart fee, the $11, well, $11 cart fee uh, that's proposed, um, you would need to, I believe you would need to play six uh, have six visits. That's a you know one round per per visit with the cart cart rental. Six of those at the one hundred and fifty dollar fee to um, to have an improvement to have a, a discount relative to the players club. Um, at an increase, the increased proposed increase uh, one seventy that um, that would jump to eight visits or you know eight rounds with uh, cart fees again eleven dollar cart fee um, uh, before you reach that discount relative to the players club so actually um, sounds spot on to to what Mr. Dietrich was saying in terms of him playing seven rounds at Tilden and, and one away means he's still with Tilden, that uh, the upper bound for the players club being a, um, a cheap Tiffany <laughs> I think our general manager from the uh, course uh, representing American Golf now has audio, uh, Tucker, okay. if, if he may speak, if, if that's okay, Chair. Yeah. Mr. Williams, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. The connection up here is a little rough right now with all the wind going on up here at the course. 
um, obviously with it being shut down right now. But I uh, just wanted to touch on a few points. Um, first of all, thank you for giving me the time to speak, uh, members of the board. I do appreciate it. Um, we definitely want the seniors to feel included here. And uh, we definitely do not want to drive away any seniors. Every rate increase and decrease was done with the idea of keeping us competitive with the current market. Uh, so just wanted to keep that in mind because there were increases, yes, but there was also decreases as well to a few of the rates that are, uh, that are highlighted there. So just wanted to outline that. It wasn't about increasing rates just for the sake of increasing rates. It's about keeping us competitive with uh, our competition in the area, uh, as I provided to Noah. Um, just wanted to touch base. Those numbers are all correct by Mr. Diedrich and uh, Mr. Dort as far as the five times a month walking and six times a month riding. Just wanted to touch base though on that, that when you do pay for the senior monthly card, which is $150, you do get unlimited rounds. Now you are limited to Monday through Friday, right? But the idea is, is that they can play as many rounds as they want during that Monday through Friday, right? So if they play five days a week, four weeks, they could play up to 20 times. Uh, right now, currently we do have 10 members, 10 pass holders, right? So out of their, I, I can't remember the number that uh, Jim was able to provide, but out of all their members, they do have 10 that use this pass. And like, and like Jim provided, there are several that only use it four to seven times a month, which I can, uh, I can provide numbers for as well. But there are seven out of 10 that actually use it more than six times a month. So on seven of the 10 members for the past three months, Obviously, at that point, they are saving money. And, and not that we have a problem with saving money, but obviously, American Golf would like to make money and not lose money like we have the last couple of years. So just, just wanted to keep that in mind. Um, you know, and if, and if I can throw out an option as well, there is option number three where we can, we can stay at the $150 rate. But at that point, we would need to introduce limits to how many rounds the uh, seniors can play during the month. Uh, because, uh, you know, I can just throw out a number. The most rounds that have been played have been 19 by a member of the senior monthly card holder. Uh, the, the fewest, I believe, are four. Uh, three to four rounds was the, the lowest number I saw about one of those members. Um, and that was during August when we were shut down for eight days due to smoke and fire, uh, fire prevention. Um, so just wanted to, to give that out as an idea. Um, it's also a little hard to compare us to other courses in terms of this membership because nobody else really has a card like this. Franklin Canyon is the only one, like Mr. Uh, Diedrich mentioned, that does have a membership like this. And they are actually increasing as well next year. Uh, the general manager, when I spoke to him, didn't know exactly how much they were going to increase. Uh, but they are. Uh, now, with that being said, the reason why a lot of courses don't do it is because it's not profitable. Um, and as you can see, it's obviously not profitable when we have seven out of 10 members playing more than the, uh, the break even point during the month. Um, Mr. So Williams, we are at time, but this is to okay. the discretion of the committee. Okay. Uh, go ahead. And, uh, why don't you go ahead and finish your thoughts, Mr. Yeah. Williams? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was, that was actually it as far as the okay. senior, uh, the senior card goes, as far as the senior rate increases go, all those were, were done with the, the thought of keeping us competitive with the, uh, the current market. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you, Ruby. Uh, we have no more, um, any more, um, public comments Not at this time. Thank you. Okay, we have we have something to chew on. Uh, <laughs> Director Waspy. He's our golfer. Pardon me, I'm chewing. Um, <laughs> I, I, I hate these things. I hate it. Um, <laughs> I, I believe in those things that parks and libraries ought to be free if you pay taxes, but I, I understand we'll never get back to that. But a couple of questions. Um, it's been brought up a couple times now. I think if we're going to do this, it's distasteful. Um, it hurts certain groups. Um, and it's not, doesn't seem to be done equally. Uh, 
So at the very least we can do, we always talk about transparency and a couple of people mentioned today. I mean, my, I guess my question would be if there was a stables person here. Do those stables, do we post this at the stables a month before, two months before or not, as was alleged today by a golfer that it was one day before that he found out? I mean, and, and if it's not, I don't care if it's it past practice. So in the future, we don't really want to surprise anybody. We ought to post any, any, if we're going to raise golf course rates at Tilden, we ought to have require that the concessionaire put that up there a month beforehand. And if we're going to raise rates at the stables, people ought to know a month before. Um, that's just a statement. I, I'd also like to see us, um, and, 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 and Mr. Tucker, I respect you and I play golf at your course and I love your course. Uh, or Mr. Tucker, uh, but, but, um, uh, It's been referred to as small businesses need to get a rate too. I don't think American golf is a small business. Uh, and I I understand golf has gone to heck in a sled and you need to make money. But I, I, I would like to know if, if I'm going to have this happen every year, these increases, and we say we're using the reference, well, we're going to give them an increase because they need it. They're losing money. I, do we? I, I, is there a fact sheet? I'd like to know. Did Tilden make money in 2019? Uh, I don't want to know that right now. I want to know if the stable made money or what their profit was. And I want to know if, uh, you know, um, I, I, I'd really like to know about Lake Chabot Marina and, and how much they made last year. Do they really need a risk? Because maybe it's legitimate. Uh, but I think they have a legitimate reason to do this. And I also think that we, as a, as a partner in this, because we do get a concession fee for this, are we maximizing this deal? Is it, is it, it's my opinion that if you raise the rates at Lake Chabot for the, and I, I focused on the, the um, tour boat, you raise the rate 66.7% for adults and 71% for kids, I think you're going to lose tons of money on that. I don't think anybody's going to do that. I think that's enough of a gap where you're going to lose revenue on that. So that means the parties lose revenue on that. So I, I know that it's more work, but I think it would be easy to require a concessionaire, and they probably do it, but I haven't seen it in this presentation. What? What? How much did you make last year? Um, and then. Uh, Maybe, uh, I don't know if they do regular audits. I'm uh, sure they do, but uh, I think you should see some of that information. Um, and I guess that's it. Director Wieskamp and then uh, AGM O'Connor. Well, it struck me that Mr. Williams sort of threw out a, an option. <clears throat> if I heard the speakers earlier, they were talking about playing six to eight times a month. If they could have a maximum of 10 times a month at 150, that might be quite reasonable for them. Now, if we want to test this back with their group, that's fine. But that struck me as a reasonable scenario for most of the members. I believe in exercise. Golf is not my thing. I know it is Dennis's. But I think for a lot of people, it's one of their favorite activities, <clears throat> plus the time on the patio that follows. That, that's part of socialization. So again, he sort of made that offer. I thought I heard earlier, most of them maybe play six to eight times a month, make it 10 times a month max and go for the 150. That's my suggestion. AGM hey, O'Connor. Just a, a, a couple of comments in terms of uh, practice that we've done with this exercise every year uh, for the committee members is one is one of our general concepts is that we we hire concession operators to know their business and their market. Um, so, you know, concession operators, we've seen them, they lower some fees, they raise some fees, they're looking at their market and determining appropriate cost. Then we do a check, and this is the, the bulk of NOAA's work, is the board has directed us to look at the, um, the market from our perspective of other like facilities and we generally try to uh, make sure that our fees are relatively in the middle of the market, the upper and the lower. We try to be in the middle. And a little bit, some cases we're a little higher, some cases we're a little lower, but that's generally how we operate in terms of um, the fee adjustments and where we're at. So just a couple of things. Those are just our historical practice with these fees and how we've approached it here at the uh, Board Operations Committee. 
Thank you, Beth. Um, and for uh, my input, I agree with both Dennis and uh, Director Wieskamp. With Dennis, I, I agreed the transparency piece, uh, having the, uh, the concessionaires uh, post what their proposed uh, uh, fees are going, that what their fee rates are going to increase by a uh, month prior or whatever uh, time we think is good. And then, uh, and also the uh, piece about, uh, you know, uh, that's that is missing is how are are, are the concessions making me how much do, how much are they making I think that's that's a that's a piece that should be included in our packets and then and then as to uh, director Wieskamp's position uh, I I heard the I heard an offer and it <laughs> done it pretty good to me um, if that's if that's amenable to the uh, the seniors that are here I think um, yeah, uh, it sounds fair to Do we have um, a floor? Mr. Williams, what's, what's your input on that? Yeah, definitely. I, uh, you know, I, I think that both of those things mentioned by the board members were reasonable in terms of uh, requiring to post it in advance. Uh, this is my first year and first time going through this process uh, with East Bay Regional Parks. Um, so, you know, I did, I did not know as far, I, I can, I guess I can blame ignorance on not knowing um, who to contact and whatnot. Um, you know, I came on board on May 8th. So this is my first time going through this process and I would have no problem doing that going forward as far as uh, being required to give advance notice to increased rates. Um, that would be no problem at all. And as far as uh, the middle ground option that I had mentioned, that sounds, uh, that sounds reasonable to me. Okay. So uh, if you don't mind, just to confirm, that sounds like we are staying with the $150 per month rate, but instituting a limit of 10, uh, 10 rounds per, per month. 10 or 12, correct? one or the other. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Diedrich, would you like? Yes, um, I, I was interested in, uh, by the way, we get along very well with Tucker. We're very happy <laughs> working with him and I don't mean any of this to reflect on him in any negative way whatsoever. Uh, but there are a few members who's, who probably live alone, who are on fixed income, who play quite a few times a week. I, I would recommend three times a week or 12 times a month. Uh, oh. some, will, some will not make that probably of the, I think, uh, Tucker said 10 people buy the card typically. Uh, that, that's correct, yes. But, but there probably is only one or two guys, three guys that exceed, exceed 12. Anyway, I would, I, would, I, I would suggest three times a week or 12 times a month. Because I actually feel sorry for those people that, I mean, they're they're pretty lonely characters, I can assure you, and 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 Tilden Park is like almost a home to them in ways. I'm I'm sure Tucker, you know who they are. Uh, so it sounds like we had a, a bit of negotiation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Major <laughs> negotiation. <laughs> um, just for the eventual, uh, the eventual uh, final um, uh, vote on this, uh, are we going then with keeping 150 but limiting it to, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know if there's a, a, a significant difference, I, I understand the difference, but a significant difference to the um, senior club or to the uh, to American golf, whether it's 12 per month or three per week, is that? Oh. So let me let's 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 hold off for a minute. This this is the committee's decision. Um, the staff has made a proposal, uh, and uh, we're looking for the uh, committee's decision on the matter. So, Direct uh, Chair Rosari, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, uh, Director Wasti. Well, yeah, I I I, I want to thank both sides for coming here and, and hashing this out. And I wish we could have could have called us beforehand if you had have known. And I hope we do inform you in the future. Being the, um, I guess I'm the only golfer on the board and, and an avid golfer. And, and uh, I, I like all the arguments as a 
lay person or, or as a golfer or, or, as, or as just a, a regular human being, I understand the fixed income as I am a senior also. I understand uh, American golf needing to make money. I was really very happy that Mr. Williams was willing to compromise in this. And with the limited amount of people that uh, are taking, you know, will, will win some type of advantage by these, which I've never seen before on a <laughs> meeting, these internal negotiations between extraneous parties. I, I will, as the most avid golfer who supports this, I'm very happy with the compromise as it was that you work out. I would give my right arm to live next to Tilden and be able to take advantage of that. For me, it would be a 30-mile drive. <laughs> I'm a full rent guy. i got to play at Redwood Canyon, and we don't have that opportunity to, uh, to, to uh, get into a club where we can get a monthly rate. So I think this is a wonderful compromise. I'm willing to support uh, the, the first and last, I assume, compromise that, that Mr. Williams was, was willing to uh, uh, are we going with, with what number? <clears throat> I think t I think ten is the uh, the uh, the number. Okay, that's fine with me. Yeah. Okay, okay. so just to uh, uh, Chair Rosario, just to, we're going to move forward um, with the remainder of this item. Yes. Uh, the proposed fee is now uh, we're changing the monthly senior ticket uh, with a limitation of ten rounds per month. Correct. So, I just want to confirm that. Noah, you have that information. <clears throat> Got it. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining us. And, and yes. uh, Chair Rosario, with <coughs> concurrence, we'll move forward with the next item. Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining uh, us. Thank, thank you. you, Noah, for all your work. Thank you. Uh, the next section is um, park use fee proposals. There are two structural change proposals, one temporary new service proposed, and one proposed increase to align with the market. First up, this is on details pages uh, 15 and 16, is a proposal to include an additional vehicle in the standard family camping reservation fee for both drive-in and RV sites district-wide. Both vehicles must still fit on the campsite parking pad. The current additional vehicle fee would be changed to an overflow parking fee at the same rate that would then apply to a third vehicle or more, or for any second vehicle that cannot fit on the campsite parking pad that otherwise would be included in the standard fee. Uh, it should definitely be noted that overflow parking spaces are very limited and there's no guarantee of availability. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is hoped that this change will improve customer service by eliminating or reducing potential misunderstanding related to the current additional vehicle fee. To offset the revenue that would be lost by the removal of the additional vehicle fee, Park District staff proposes increasing the drive-in site and RV site fee by $5 excuse me, per night at all locations. The increased camping fees are similar to California State Parks camping fees. Uh, however, there the base fee includes entry for one vehicle and one legally towed vehicle, but additional vehicles must use day use parking if available at $6 to $10 per vehicle. Uh, the exception here is higher camping fees at Dumbarton Quarry, and it should be noted that these sites also include Wi-Fi. Mm. All right, I'll move on. Uh, next up, this is details page 16. Um, oh, this Noah, Noah sorry, can we hold off for a minute? I think, um, I think we should give the committee members a chance to weigh in on this item before we move on. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so why don't we stop there and jerk, uh, Chair Rosario, if you, if you want, we uh, were available for questions. Yep. Questions, Director Waspy. Um, I have no, I, I, I support this because I know that um, both Anthony Chabot and Del Valle are very popular. They're very well run. They're beautiful amenities and they're the only game in town, I might add. They're the only campgrounds around and the, the, the Martin's coming on. So I, I know that they, you can probably charge 50 bucks a night and get away with it. I wouldn't support it, but you could easily get 50 bucks a night and it'd still be full. So I, I think this is a minor change. And, and I think uh, uh, I, I, I favor that. And I don't think anybody would say this is draconian or, or mean spirit. It, it, it's, it's, and I also think it's probably the going right around. Well, there's no going right around here, but I was just up in the Sierras this last weekend and that's what camps cost. Director Wieskamp. 
I think it's fine. Seems reasonable. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, the uh, the additional vehicles has is, is always been a nightmare working in right. the camps. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard people call and complain to me <laughs> yeah. about this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and just uh, just because uh, uh, I think right now, because of COVID and, and our limited space, we're, we're aren't uh, extra vehicles not allowed? Yeah, we are limiting it to two vehicles, correct? <coughs> That's what I thought. And then okay, just, as, just as a reminder, this is this is a more of a convenience move because it makes it yeah. simpler at the kiosk. We're not doing right. this exchange for an extra vehicle. And we still are limiting to on the camping pad. So there's not going to be vehicles out, you know, off the pad, off the pavement. So it's consistent with our past practice. Excellent. Good. I think we're in agreement. In agreement. Okay, oh, Noah, you're ready. All right, thank you. I'll move on to the next one. Again, this is a details page 16, a proposal to increase the Botanic Gardens low impact private event fee for both non-residents and residents of Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Uh, although the proposed increase more than doubles the current rates, this fee has not changed since being established in 2012, and the proposed rates are still well below the fee, excuse me, the few similar services available at the UC Berkeley Botanic Garden, Botanical Garden, excuse me, and the city of Walnut Gardens <coughs> and other farms. I will move on if there's no comments to the next one. This Seeing is none. detailed. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, please, please proceed. All right, thank you. Um, the next item is on details, page 17. It's a similar proposal, um, and this one is for a new service just down the road at Tilden's Brazilian Room. <clears throat> um, this proposal would add a temporary reservation that would be available only during COVID-19 shelter in place order restrictions. <clears throat> and this new service would be limited to just the patio of the Brazilian Room, two hours only, with a maximum of 12 persons. And it should definitely be noted that food and beverages would be prohibited. There would be no indoor access. That means no restroom access. <laughs> the proposed, I just wanna highlight that. <laughs> Could be very I think important. that's a good thing to highlight. <laughs> um, the proposed <laughs> is well below the few similar services available again at UC Berkeley Botanical Garden and the city of Walnut Creek's gardens at Heather Farms. So where are the nearest restrooms from there? I believe um, they would be down the road. I apologize, I don't remember the name of the uh, picnic site, but there's bathrooms just down the road from the Brazilian room. I think that's, that's right. Anza View. It, it might be Anza View. Dan, there's Dan, great, we've got an expert. <laughs> Hi, Dan Sykes, Park Lane Union Manager. Uh, there's restrooms open at this point down uh, next to the Botanic Garden or across from the Botanic Garden uh, called Camp Oaks. And also, um, yeah, yeah, so that would be the closest one. As long as you give them a menu that has that information. Definitely, we will highlight. Uh, would the uh, renters be, uh, have the ability to bring in a uh, porta potty? That's an excellent question. Um, I don't know the answer yeah. not off the top of my head. They would probably, <laughs> I guess it would have to be put in the parking lot, but but yeah. I, I don't know that. How close are those nearby restaurants? It's down the hill. Well, <laughs> uh, downhill, and then they can come back up after relief. So that's probably good. Come on. All right, Director Weas Camp, I, I would estimate it's um, uh, maybe a uh, thousand feet. I should think, something like that. I should think that would work as long as everybody's warned. This is where they are. And mm -hmm. Tiffany, do you want to jump in there about don't we have availability, availability for the rent restrooms? <laughs> we do have the rooms. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, we do have the ability to do that. I think our concept with this patio wedding is to really get the kind of photo opportunity uh, uh, that people are seeing. Uh, we're seeing a lot of it in the park anyway. It's called the elopement trend people oh. coming they dress up in the full you know wedding beautiful right. gear get their photos taken with the view and then they're kind of on their way so we aren't really looking to um have them linger on the patio 
the $300 is just a nominal um, uh, fee to help us cover the logistics of it. And it corresponds to the rate for an extra hour currently okay. at the Brazil room. Okay. So <clears throat> that's Sounds the end. Good. So there's no, no food and beverage and it's supposed to be a very quick event. Um, it's it's that's fine. not meant to linger. Okay. okay. Correct. Good. Imaginative, whoever thought of it. Uh, Carry on. I believe that credit goes to Sarah Lamborn, the facilities, uh, reservable facilities supervisor there. Okay, good. All right. I will move on to the final item. Yay. Uh, details page 17. Um, this is uh, the second proposed structural change. This proposal would change swim access fees district wide to whole dollars by decreasing the senior children and disabled swim access fee while increasing the swim access fee for all other adults. This proposed structural change to whole dollars is intended to simplify fees and improve customer service. The difference in total revenue should be minimal and the removal of coins will el eliminate current labor intensive practices that are needlessly inefficient and increase the chance of errors. Tiffany. Good thinking. I'll just add that, that um, Chair Rosario is familiar with this as he also serves on the finance committee. And uh, this was a recommendation uh, from internal audit that we um, are embracing and following up on. We think it's a good one just to go and eliminate change. So that, that was the origin uh, for this change. Very logical. Okay. Yeah. And I will add, although it might just be a temporary COVID um, issue, but uh, there is apparently a shortage of, of coins of change uh, right. nationwide. <clears throat> I think uh, uh, Direct, Director Waspy has ex experience with change. Remember those, uh, <laughs> the fee machine at Roberts? <laughs> I also remember, I, I can't do the math here, but I also remember it was very simple when my mom would just give me a dime and I'd go to Coke in it every day in 1964, <laughs> every day in the summer. So, but that's an easy one. Great idea. This was uh, the, yeah, very easy one. So, okay. Uh, that's good. it. And, and, oops, sorry. Didn't mean to speak over your director, Rosario. Oh, no, no, we're good. We're good. So, um, we need to make a recommendation for the entire package. <laughs> Who do we trust made notes on all that? Tiffany? Oh, I Noah? Noah, I Noah and <laughs> Tiffany? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Noah, as always, you impress me with your meticulousness. Oh, thank you. I try. I appreciate that. Well, I think you, I was always impressed when you were hunting down merry-go-rounds around the world, <laughs> finding the different traces on the, uh, no, no, I think you do a good job of getting it on a, quite a variety of different types of services. Certainly. No, so, would you review the the changes from right. the original staff proposal? Would you review those, please? Uh, yes, absolutely. the um, The only direct fee change uh, would be the uh, the one for the Tilden uh, Tilden Park Golf Course senior monthly ticket um, that will remain at one hundred and fifty dollars per month, but a new limit of 10, uh, 10 rounds per month will be added to that and established to that. So Director Rosario, the um, staff recommendation, uh, that is the only change in the staff recommendation that's included in the staff report with the packet. Okay. Great. Good. So um, on my agenda, it says this is information only, but I think we need a recommendation to take this to the rest of the board. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay, I will, I will entertain a motion. So move. Second. Okay, moved by Director Waspy and seconded by Director Wieskamp, or was that the opposite? Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we're going to agree, but. Motion. We're in agreement. We take a vote. Uh, roll yes. call vote, please. Yes, I will. Director Rosario? Aye. Director Waspy? Aye. Director Wieskamp? Yes. All right. So moved. Yes. Hey, team. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Ooh. Yeah, Thank this is so a very uh, tedious process and we really oh, yeah. trust Noah to do the work, but it gives us lots of information for decision-making. So thank you, Noah. Yeah, yeah. very, uh, very yes, appreciative please. for all the work. Um, yes, works hard. If, if you can incorporate the um, 
the recommendations from uh, uh, Director Waspy and myself, that would be great too. Yes, I do have notes for, um, for uh, requesting that uh, concessionaires post their proposals prior to uh, prior to this meeting. So we can definitely- It would be very informative for them. Yeah, yeah I, well, we might we might see more. <laughs> we might see more <laughs> negotiations on the committee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I've never sure seen that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I All hope right. never to again. <laughs> this has been a whale of a meeting, guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we have. Oh, let's see. Uh, any further board comments? AGM comments? Just very quickly, um, I think all of you know there's been some changes in the public health orders around playgrounds. And yes. so staff are looking at uh, adapting our, uh, our program, our, our COVID safety guidelines and uh, public signage around hopefully opening our playgrounds again. So uh, we'll be sharing that with the board members uh, as soon as we're ready to, uh, to reveal that. But uh, both counties now are in alignment to allow uh, playgrounds to reoperate. So we're looking to get that done for the park district. Good. Great. Uh, oh, if I can go back to uh, board comments for a sec. I see Kelly Barrington's name there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just said I had. I just wanted to mention this uh, while while I'm uh, while we're on the air still. Kelly promised that he would have put uh, have the uh, the interior of the uh, Piedmont stables painted by 2021 and also have the uh, retaining wall done. <laughs> He said he promised he'd put it on FAMAS. So we all hear it, it's a recorded. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'll take on Kelly, I'm not going to. The director is already in the 2021 work plan and uh, I think Nate Luna's still on this call too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Kelly, it sounds like you promised to put it on FAMAS. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Nate, That's you smart. are famous. That's what's good about you. <laughs> Thomas is a right. Thomas. Any other I'm comments? Going. Okay. Uh, we are done. Thank you all so much for a good meeting. And uh, please stay well and stay safe.